Board is now returning to open session from closed session. Well, she's going to have to. We're going to move on to the, um, there were no closed session action items, so we're going to move on to the adoption of the closed session consent agenda. A motion is in order. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Jesse. I move that pursuant to Virginia Codes 2.2-3712, the closed session of Prince William County School Board meeting of January 2nd, 2019, be certified by adopting the following resolution. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Prince William County School Board hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meetings requirements were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification resolution applies, and two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard and discussed or yeah. considered by the school board. Ms. Jesse, we're, we're, um, you're one ahead on the closed session certification. Can you do the approval of the closed session consent agenda? 701, sorry. Excuse That's my me. Fault. I'm sorry. They're going to have to uh, please ask that they refresh because since we moved people around on the dais, yes. everyone's not logged in yet. F5. Thank you. Mm. Okay, so again, we'll go back to 7.01. That will be the um, adoption on. of the closed session consent agenda. Hold on, I got to oh. get in. Okay. Everybody in? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Jesse. I move that the Prince William County School Board appro approve the closed session consent agenda as recommended. Uh, do I have a second? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Ralston. I second. Discussion, please vote. We're going to move on to the uh, adoption of the closed session cons um, uh, certification. Ms. Jesse, if you want a uh, motion's in order, go yeah. ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3712, the closed session of the Prince William County School Board meeting on January 2nd, 2019. Be s Thank you, guys be certified by adopting the following resolution. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Prince William County School Board hereby certifies, to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification resolution applies, and two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convened in the closed meeting were heard and discussed or considered by the school board. Do I have a second? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Williams. A second. Discussion? Please vote. The last vote was 8-0 on the approval of closed session consent agenda. Next the school year, we're going to, we're kicking off the business of our meetings with a response to community requests to hear more about the good things that our schools, students, and staff members are accomplishing. We are working with the schools and our communications team to spotlight a few of the good news items at these meetings and elsewhere with the term positively PWCS. Tonight's presentation comes from the Brentsville District and will be introduced by Mr. Gil Trenum. Mr. Trenum. Mr. Chairman, before we do this, do we need to uh, announce the re results of the, the last vote or? Mm -hmm. well, sure. Um, was it, did you put it up? 
It was eight nothing. Thanks. Okay. Great. Uh, Thank you, Chairman Latif. Uh, tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Richard, Nix Richard Nichols, the principal of Stonewall Jackson High School, Assistant Principal Rhonda Carper, and Ms. Stephanie Nash. They're going to share with us more information on an award that the school has earned from Jobs for Virginia grads. Uh, good evening, Dr. Latif, Dr. Waltz, uh, Mr. Turner, members of the school board. Uh, we're pleased to be here this evening to uh, share with you some good news uh, from Stonewall Jackson High School to help our students uh, graduate from Stonewall Jackson High School. Uh, four years ago, Stonewall was given the opportunity to apply for a competitive grant application uh, called the Jobs for Virginia Graduates through the Department of Education. Um, and I'd like to introduce Ms. Rhonda Carper, our assistant principal, who was the one who uh, got the grant started and applied for the grant. Uh, and our current JVD teacher, Ms. Stephanie Nash, also the math uh, co-department chair. Um, the other member who was not here, who retired, and who also started the program was our teacher uh, administrator, Mr. Michael Stafford, who started the program, uh, but has since retired and is living in South Carolina. Um, so basically what the JVG program uh, does for students is it gives them an opportunity um, to make sure that they are going to complete all of their graduation requirements on time. Uh, and then once they graduate, that they will have an opportunity to gain full employment. Um, and that is through the work of the teachers uh, in the program. And so Mrs. Nash works with our counselors and other staff to, to recruit and select students. This year she has 35 students uh, in the program. Um, students generally are selected on a criteria um, that they are at risk of not graduating from high school without the additional support that this program provides. Uh, the program is part of a larger program nationwide called the Jobs for American Graduates. Um, and so JVG is the state branch or affiliate of that program. Uh, it's a public-private partnership, a 501c3, uh, and the students, as I said, do benefit uh, from a matching grant. Stonewall Jackson receives $25,000 per year uh, to, to run the program and support the students in the class. So this year we were pleased uh, when Mr. B Glenn the director of the program uh, for JVG came to us on October 29th and presented us with the Stonewall Jackson High School with the Five for Five Award. Uh, so the Jobs for America's Graduate Five of Five Award is the highest honor given to a state affiliate and recognizes the program for achieving all five of the national standards. JAG is the national affiliate of JVG. The five performance categories are a 90% graduation rate a 60% civilian jobs military rate, 80% positive outcome rate, that's on their, their skills and the standards that they must meet, full-time placement rate, and 60% full-time job rate. JVG, as I mentioned, is a 501c3, and to help students um, in Virginia and nationwide as part of the JAG program. So we're very fortunate to be part of this program. Like I said, this is our fourth year. Uh, Ms. Nash has done an outstanding job. Uh, Ms. Carper does an outstanding job uh, with uh, each year the competitive grant application, making sure we're up to date uh, and that we're receiving our funds. Uh, but most importantly, you can see in the videos uh, the various students and some of the things uh, that they're doing currently. Um, they're great kids, and we're hoping for 100% graduation rate this year. So thank you. If you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Mr. Trenum. Uh Thank you. Uh, Ms. Na Nash, I was just wondering if you could kind of give us a little more detail as far as what, what is involved with the students and, and the action and what, how it helps them. The program is set aside for students who, what we call, have barriers for success. So I basically work with them to get them ready for the real world. We work on interview skills. We work on going out to see various jobs, job shadowing. They start a business. Our business this year is they have started the unified basketball team for Stonewall. So they are creating it from start to finish, whether it be the shirts, making the shirts, various things, putting down all the practices, working with the, the special ed students. They're putting it together. Um, we go on college tours, we bring the community in to get them ready for interviews. They go and seek other um, job shadowing. We, we talk about real life situations. 
We also work, I also work with partnering with other jobs and businesses in the community to make sure that these kids have quality jobs once they leave the school. This is not only a one-year program, it's a two-year program. So once they leave Stonewall Jackson High School, I have to meet with them once a month for a full year to see what they are doing. If they need a job, I work with them. If they need, and if they're, I work with their employer to see where I can help their employer make them better employees. This is not just a one-year program, and that's what makes it so great. So these kids come back to me, I need help with my SATs. I need help with trying to get ready for this scholarship or get this job interview. Hey, can you send me this? Can you send me that? How, can you read this to make sure that I am leaving this job in a respectable way? So these the kids start out being barriers to success, but once they leave my job, my program, they're actually productive citizens in this community. And that's what I'm more proud of the most. Ms. Jesse. Uh, thank you very much. When I came on the board, I came with an elementary background, and I'm mm -hmm. learning a great deal about high schools. Um, Believe it or not, attending all the big graduations was very insightful for me mm -hmm. because at some point as a mom, I thought once those hats fly up in the air and everybody's so happy, what's going to happen next month? What happens to the kids who are very bright kids, mm -hmm. but they're not going to college? Mm -hmm. So I know that Mr. Wright and various people here know that I've been very interested in career education. Mm -hmm. I would like to see, I know members of this board share this vision that I would like to see all of our graduates to, when they leave either enter the workforce in a full-time position, a career, mm -hmm. or either enter college. So I think the work that you're doing is just phenomenal. Thank you so much. Thank you. And you have the biggest smile. Your <laughs> eyes just yeah. dance. You I'm seem, very proud. Yeah, I can tell. I can tell. Thank you very much. Ms. Williams. Um, I just wanted to thank you for the work that you're doing because I know a lot of times the children who are the most at risk don't have the same advantages because they don't come to the same, they don't graduate from high school with the same set of skills or have parents who have gone before them to show them the way. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that the work you're doing is critical. You're in, in not only benefiting those students directly, but any generation that comes after them because you've laid a new foundation um, for continuous good citizenship. So thank you for that time and um, for getting this grant. It's, it's really you. exciting. Mr. Chenum. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have one more question. So is this an ongoing grant program or do you have to reapply every two years or how does that work and where do we stand with the funding? We, we reapply every year. So we have to meet the criteria of the grant. We have to prove that we've met the criteria. And then um, what our, our, our goals are for the coming year and how we intend to meet those goals. And so we wait to hear whether or not we'll be honored again to have the program. Um, but it's, it's a phenomenal program. We have kids who have so many barriers. And Mrs. Nash is, um, is mom, social worker, um, job <laughs> coach. You name the role and she's it. So we're. We're just in complete awe continually with the work that she does. Thank you all so very much for uh, sharing this great news about the Stonewall Jackson High School, and congratulations again on your award. Thank you. I'd like to add. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Um, Nichols and the staff for coming over here. I, I know many of the folks at Stonewall Jackson, and I got to attend their commencement last year, and they have a fierce loyalty to their principal and their high school. And, um, and I hear many good things about what's happening out there, and this is a great example of that. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. And I would like to um, – here we go. Sorry. I would like to call the meeting of the Prince William County School Board to order. There will be a moment of silence at the request of Lily Jesse, the Aquan District. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to um, the Pledge of Allegiance. Do we have a student who would like to lead us in the pledge? They can come up to the microphone, introduce themselves, and 
Lead us in the pledge. Do you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic which it stands, one nation, under God, invisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, okay, great. Um, before we um, get started, I'm going to take one moment to, uh, I'd like to um, take this opportunity to thank Mr. Thomas Bollock, the school board parliamentarian, for his excellent service and helpful advice he has provided the school board since 2017. The training, consultations, opinions, and other assistance of parliamentary nature, which Mr. Balk has shared with us, enable the school board to navigate routine parliamentary issues going forward. For that reason, Mr. Balk will not be sitting with the board on a regular basis this year, but will remain available to the school board on an as-needed basis and as a resource for parliamentary questions and issues as they arise. Thank you, Mr. Balk, for your service. Okay. Next, we're going to go to the annual organization meeting. Um, I need um, 12.01. This item is for action. This is, um, can I have a motion? Mr. Chairman? Ms. Uh, Williams. I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the annual organization meeting agenda as recommended. Do I have a Mr. second? Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Ms. Ralston. I second. Uh, any discussion? Please vote. The vote is eight yes, unanimous. Motion passed. Okay, great, thank you. Next, we'll move on to the nomination for vice chairman. This, on, this item is on for action. A motion is in order, and I will um, actually make the first motion. Um, I would like to nominate um, Lori Williams of the Woodbridge District to be vice chair of the Prince William County School Board for the year 2019. I've known Lori for many years. I'm a big fan. I think she's done a great service to the Woodbridge District and has served her district very well. And, um, and so I'm putting her name up for nomination for vice chair. Any other nominations? Oh, sorry, I need a second. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, Lily Jesse from the Algonquin District. I second the motion for Ms. Uh, Williams. Ms. Williams has been very active in various organizations, including the Virginia School Board Association, and uh, has been an active supporter of many projects uh, on the school board and has served with distinction. Thank you. Okay. Discussion? Further nominations? Mr. Balk. Uh, according to the policy that was adopted, uh, what happens is that the first nominee can be debated and then is voted up or down, and only if that first nominee is defeated is then another motion in order for another nominee. Discussion? Okay. Please vote. Thank you, Mr. Bogg. The vote is three yes. Latif, Jesse, Williams, five no. Motion failed. 
So now I'll open the floor for another nomination. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Trenum. I move that the Prince William County School Board elect Mr. Justin Wilk as Vice Chairman for 2019. Do you have a second? I'll second. Please vote. Or I am sorry, discussion? Please vote. The vote is seven yes, one no, Williams, motion passed. Thank you. Congratulations, Mr. Wilk. I look forward to working with you. I'm excited. I think um, Justin Wilk also has done a terrific job for his district, and I look forward to working with all of you on this board as we move forward. We're going to move next to clerk appointment, 12.03. A motion is in order. Mr. Chairman? Ms. Williams. I move that the Prince William County School Board appoint Deborah H. Urban as clerk of the Prince William County School Board for 2019. The salary for the clerk shall be as currently budgeted. Do you have a second? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Ralston. I second. Mo, discussion? Please vote. The vote is eight yes, unanimous. Motion passed. Next, we'll move to 12.04, Deputy Clerk appointment. A motion is in order. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Williams. I move that the Prince William County School Board appoint B. Simpson as the Deputy Clerk of the Prince William County School Board for 2019. The salary for the Deputy Clerk shall be as currently budgeted. Do you have a second? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Ralston. I second. Discussion? Please vote. The vote is eight yes, unanimous, motion passed. 12.05, corpus surety bond for the clerk and deputy clerk. Items on for action, the motion's in order. Do I have a motion? Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Mr. Trenum. I move that the Prince William County School Board require a corporate security bond in the amount of $10,000 for the clerk and, and the deputy clerk to the school board, conditioned upon the faithful performance and discharge of their duties, with the premium for such bonds to be paid for by the school board. Second. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Williams. Second. Discussion, please vote. The vote is eight yes, unanimous, motion passed. 12.06, time, date, location, school board meeting, 17 for 2019, right? Uh, this item's on for action, motion's in order. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Trenum. I move that the Prince William County School Board establish the location of its regular school board meetings at 14715 Bristow Road, Manassas, Virginia, on the first and third Wednesdays of the month, January through June, and September through December. Closed session meetings shall convene at 6 p.m., and public meetings shall convene at 7 p.m. A few adjustments will be made to accommodate spring break, graduation, the Virginia School Board Association's annual convention, and winter break. Do I have a second? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Williams. Second. Discussion? Please vote. The vote is eight yes, unanimous. Motion passed. 1207, superintendents designee to attend school board meetings. This item's on for action. The motion's in order. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Williams. I move that Keith Iman, Deputy Superintendent, be appointed as the designee of the division superintendent to attend meetings of the school board in the absence or inability of the superintendent to attend. Do I have a second? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Ralston. I second. Discussion? Please vote. <laughs> Mr. Balk, since you're here and it's your last night on 12. Vote point is eight. Yes, unanimous. Motion passed. Great. On 12.08, do we got to read all that? Do we actually have to read it out loud? 
No, Mr. Chairman, since it is projected on the screen and been distributed, it can just be identified by its title. Outstanding. For the, for the sake of time being, please everyone take a look up there and read it. Um, this is the membership in professional organizations and appointment of representatives from our school board to a variety of different organizations. Um, can I have a motion to? Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, Mr. I move the Prince William County School Board approve the appointments of the organizations committees as follows uh, and written in 12.08. Outstanding. Do I have a second? A second. Ms. Williams, second. Um, discussion, please vote. Thank you, Mr. Bollock. Can we do the same thing, Mr. Balk, on 13? Excellent, you're a good man. I'm waiting for the vote. Hold on, I'm waiting for the vote from Debbie. I'm still waiting for people to vote. Who needs to vote? Okay. Dr. Latif, Mr. Deutsch, and Mr. Trent. I voted. I'll hit, I'll hit F5, but I voted. I don't know how to do that. I can, I can put in your vote for you if you. Um, I see it. How about yes? The vote is eight yes, unanimous. Motion passed. Excellent. Approval of agenda. Moving on to the approval of public meeting agenda. Motion's in order. Mr. Chairman, I move this Mr. Williams County School Board approves public meeting agenda as recommended. Do I have a second? Mr. Chairman. Williams. A second. Discussion, please vote. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Ms. Satterwhite. Uh, I believe uh, Dr. Waltz has something. Oh, on. yes, Dr. Waltz. Yes, the administration requests deferring uh, 20.01 milestone communications deed. That should be taken off the agenda. Okay, I, I think that was already moved to board matters. Right, it should right. be removed completely. Okay, so we'll removed completely. But that won't affect this current vote on the consent it agenda. Does. It does? Got it. Mm -hmm. Why? Because why? it's not on consent, it's I don't think. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Do we need to fix that, Debbie? Yes, sir. Okay. Do I need to hit refresh, or we need to hit refresh, or no? We will. <coughs> uh, just right. wait for me to take it off, and then I'll Got let it. you know. Oh, I see. That's for the approval agenda. Which one was it? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If everyone would refresh. The vote hasn't popped up yet. I need the first and second. I'm sorry. Mr. Chairman, I'll move the adoption of the public meeting agenda as recommended now. Deutsch first. Mr. Second. Chairman, I'll second. Williams second. Trenum third.
Vote is eight yes, unanimous. Motion passed. Moving on to the adoption of the consent agenda. A motion is in order. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Williams. I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the public meeting consent agenda as recommended. Second. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Discussion? Please vote. The second was Mr. Trenum. Sorry, I cut you off. The vote is eight yes, unanimous. Motion passed. During this time on the agenda, the student representative and alternates will speak and have an opportunity to introduce themselves and share their interests. Um, today we have Mr. Vilfredo Villatoro from Garfield High School sitting in for Sasan Faraj. Mr. Vilfredo. Okay. Good evening, everyone, and Happy New Year. Taking into account the recent winter break, I hope everyone's full of energy and ready to make this 2019 a year full of valuable experiences and accomplishments. Tonight I'll be speaking on behalf of our student representative, Sasan Faraj. Despite not attending tonight, Sasan has taken the time to write a great part of the following report. Reflecting on the last four months and the start of the new year, it is important to go over some of the overarching topics of the student body. Successfully, the student representative and the alternates have, signif have significantly established dialogues in the last four months with the high schools such as Osborne Park, Butterfield, Cogan, Patriot, Garfield, Woodbridge, Potomac, and Hilton High School. It has been quite difficult, yet very gratifying to have developed multiple conversations with the schools mentioned previously. To, through these meetings, we have observed a vast range of perspectives and concerns in which we have tried to present them to a school board based merely upon our commitment to give a voice to a student body in general. In the context of a new budget and adjustments and the continuous innovations of schools in Prince William County, students have stated the importance of open space in schools, especially those who lack windows. The root of the argument is, in fact, the lack of interaction with the environment students have. To understand this, we can summarize so in the fact that students barely go outside the building, but only during PE or fire drills. Some students have stated that it's a need, yet others have said that it's more of a want. But both sides agree that schools should promote students taking benefit of the green spaces we currently have, as well as developing infrastructure that brings natural light into the building, such as windows. For instance, students claim that seeing sunlight during a long day of testing and learning can provide energy to get through the rest of the day, especially during winter when students wait in the dark for their buses and go to school without seeing any sunlight. Being exposed to sunlight during the day might even have an, might even have an effect in their academic performance. It goes on to say that schools such as Garfield and Woodbridge are primary examples of this need. Overall, some fresh air and sunlight are always good, especially after a difficult day. Another topic among students is the concern about the diversification of lunch options. This has been mentioned at most of the past board meetings, and I greatly appreciate that the board members have looked into this. During our meetings with Garfield, Osborne Park, Woodbridge, and Potomac High School, we have explained that lunches are selected upon priorities. Top priority is nutrition rather than taste. Students have completely understood the statement, yet they claim that certain minorities are not benefiting from the current lunch selection. Examples are students with allergies, vegetarians, and other students who, due to religious background, would like to see more accommodations. Schools with higher populations of students with dietary restrictions should have more variety in, within the menu because going to school and having the same meal repeatedly can damp the education environment a school produces. Many students have the option to change what the, their main course is for lunch. However, there are students who are sub subject to the same lunch every school day. Moreover, at the meeting with Hilton High School, students brought up that sometimes lunches would, lunches would run out, of, out before the end of the day. As we continue to make or run through the high schools, we will see if, there, if this is an overarching trend. Making sure that students' concerns are presented to a school board is the first step to reaching social accommodations. Lastly is mental health. Students appreciate the county's efforts to reduce the number of students per counselor in the high schools, the recent creation of new positions, and the, continu uh, the continuous funding of programs that allow not only dialogue but the establishment of new policies. I'll clear examples of how, how students feel um, the difference within their schools. Decreasing the number of students per counselor helps counselors create more time for each student, given that there is still a relatively high number of students per counselor. If students continue su to support the idea of annual mandatory in-person training for teachers about suicide prevention and depression. That being said, the Student Summit, a student's conversation on mental health, is, it is 
is this Saturday at Hilton High School. All the student representatives will be attending. This summit will provide a more insight into students' perspective perspective of how mental health is addressed within the county. Another claim was the cross-training regarding mental health among schools. For example, providing certain teachers or coaches with advanced training based on the fact that when students are encountered by a problem, they are more likely to go to have more confidence and trust, trust in a coach rather than a counselor. So some will be present at the next school board um, meeting and also the summit. Yet before, he will be meeting with Stonewall, ja Stonewall Jackson um, SEA on the 7th and Freedoms SEA on the 9th. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Villatoro. Next, we'll be moving on to, Annabelle's not here, right? Okay. Next, we'll be moving on to citizen comments on the agenda and non-agenda items. It looks like we have, oh, it's like 36 people um, that signed up in advance and, um, and at the door. Everyone that signed up in advance will have a chance to speak, and uh, we're just going to go through everyone tonight uh, first. If we are still within our, um, we're, we're yeah, we're going to do everyone at the at the. We we're doing all of them. So yeah, I will call the first ten names and ask you to take a seat in the front row. Uh, Lisa Terry, Rebecca Relahan, Eloise Relahan, Colin Relahan, Rachel Freeman, Tara, Tara Turner, Mike and Wendy Haddock, Elizabeth George, Robert Buckley, Michael Butler. You have three minutes to speak and the clerk will keep the time. The lights on the monitor will indicate your progress. The yellow light will signify that you should sum up your position. Red indicates your time is up uh, and you should stop. Please use proper decorum and manners while at the podium. If you do not do so, you'll be asked to step aside. Please give your name and address for the record when you approach the podium. When it does turn red, I will ask you to sit down and it's not personal, it's just we do have a lot of folks here and we wanna get through everybody. Our first speaker is Lisa Terry. Good evening, my name is Lisa Terry. I live at 107 Edge Hill Drive in Occoquan, 22125. I have two uh, children who attend Occoquan Elementary School. Sorry. And I'm here to kind of uh, talk about the reasons why I think that the town of Occoquan should stay within the school boundaries of Occoquan Elementary School because I think the last thing you should be doing is removing students from a school that is one of the best performing in, in the school district. Also, I've been attending some of the community meetings and something that the facilitator has mentioned is that the reason that they've had to do extensions on the west and moving kids west is because there wasn't land available on the east side to build a new school. But from what I understand, Occoquan Elementary actually already has um, land ready to, to be built, but it's just on a long-term plan. So I understand that the school is going to be built. There will be more students who can attend Occoquan Elementary, but that was put forward uh, to be like 10 years from now. So I think if we don't um, come up with a solution to this, 10 years from now, a lot of these same families are gonna be here again and will be displaced again. So I think that, um, I don't think there's a, a family at Occoquan Elementary that would have a problem with having kids stay in the trailers if they knew that there was a new, new school on the horizon. So um, I also think that this uh, is really adversely affecting military and foreign service families. I myself am a foreign service officer. My kids are you know, subject to having to change schools when I have to, to PCS. So it's because of my service to the government, but when we come back to the US, then now they're having to, to be changed from another school, kind of unnecessarily, I think. And I also have a special needs child. I haven't heard anything about how these changes, what's going to be done for, for kids, especially like on the spectrum, who um, have a really difficult time dealing with, with change. Um, as I said, I am a foreign service officer, so my kids, they are kind of used to changing, but it's new country, new school, not when you know, you're in the same country to have to go to another school. My neighborhood, there's a lot of military. So um, I also don't think that it's a good thing that we're going to be, with this change, increasing the percentage of minority students at OES and then decreasing it at Rockledge Elementary School. So I think that kind of goes against what, what should be done. And then I know a lot of people have talked about the distance and having to have all these kids onto Old Bridge Road, whereas right now they just kind of cross the street 
It's also gonna make it really difficult for parents without transportation to be able to get to the school in case of emergency or for um, student events. Thank you. Sorry. Rebecca Relaham. I apologize if I say the names wrong. That's okay. Uh, good evening, um, school board members. My name is Rebecca Relihan, and I have a daughter at Springwoods Elementary, and we live in Old Bridge Estates. Um, first, I would like to encourage you to vote for Plan 2A or Plan 3. I am against Plan 3A because it removes 20 children from Springwoods Elementary in the Old Bridge Estates neighborhood. My daughter would be one of two girls to be moved to Lake Ridge Elementary and then have to go to Woodbridge Middle rather than Lake Ridge Middle with the rest of her school. This does not align with the geographic prog progression criteria in 264-2. As we know, middle school can be a very challenging time due to the fragile state of the development, both physically and emotionally, for this age group. And in fact, the suicide rate for middle schoolers doubled from 2007 to 2014. We should be setting these children up for success by sending them on to school with a familiar peer group and a sense of community. The Springwoods boundaries for all three plans are identical except for the removal of 20 children in Plan 3A. The boundaries for Antietam, Lake Ridge, Old Bridge, and Springwoods <clears throat> are identical in Plan 3 and 3A except for the removal of 20 children from Springwoods in Plan 3A. This movement is unnecessary. Next, I would like to bring up the last minute out of boundary committee change in Plan 2A, which allows Occoquan to retain 80 students who should have otherwise been moved to Rock Ledge in the original Plan 2A. On December 20th, Mr. Halsey from Dr. Cartledge's office called a boundary committee member to inform her of this change, which was made out of committee. On December 26th, an email was sent to families of only four schools to inform them of this change. The portal was also updated that day with a new version of Plan 2A. This clearly violates Regulation 264-2. Since this regulation has not been followed, I emailed asking that Springwoods be given the same consideration as these Occoquan students. I have yet to hear back from Dr. Cartledge. One boundary committee member emailed me and was completely unaware of this change. Given this incident, I feel strongly that the school board should give Springwoods the same consideration and keep our children at Springwoods Elementary, especially because Springwoods has added an addition, and unlike um, Occoquan Elementary, Springwoods is not overcrowded. Um, thank you so much for your time, and Happy New Year. Eloise Rollahan. Hello, my name is Eloise Rallihan, but you can call me Ella. I am in third grade at Springwoods Elementary, and I live in Old Brick Estates. I am here to ask that you vote for Plan 2A or Plan 3. Please do not pick Plan 3A or Plan 3, uh, because it moves 20 kids out of Springwoods. I have been at Springwood since kindergarten, and I do not want to move to Lake Ridge. My reasons are that all the teachers are really nice, and Ms. Maynard is the best principal anyone could ask for. In first grade, my grandma had cancer, and my teacher baked cookies for me and sent them home in my backpack. Another reason for us to stay is that we all fit on two buses. My bus would drive right past my street but not pick me up next year. We would have to be on a third bus and drive further away. Another thing is that I have seen my school go through construction for a year because we were getting new kids. Why would they do that and then make 20 of us go to a different school? This year, I helped raise money for our fun run. That money is going to buy Kindles for third and fourth graders. I would like to see fourth graders I would like to see my hard work pay off by getting to use them next year. Plan 3A moves a very small number, only 20 kids out of Oldbrook Estates and Springwoods. I will only know one other third grade girl if I get moved. Please vote for Plan 2A or Plan 3 because I love Springwoods. It is the best school in the universe. Thank you for your time. Happy New Year's. Thank you. Colin Relahan. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, good evening, members of the school board. Um, my name is Colin Relihan. Uh, I'm Eloise's dad and a, a Springwoods Elementary parent. I am here to discuss the elementary school boundary process as well, um, particularly the negative effects that Plan 3A would have on the Springwoods and Old Bridge Estates um, communities. Um, first of all, just want to note that Old Bridge Estates we, we think was blindsided by Plan um, 3A. Um, after a year of construction disrupting Springwoods <laughs> Elementary um, to add more students, we were very much kind of, we didn't expect that they would be there would be plans that would actually pull students out of Springwoods. It just didn't make much sense. And following two community comment meetings prior to the holidays, we were left that same impression. Um, plans three and three A had not yet been created, um, and no Old Bridge Estates parent knew at that time that they would be affected by the process. Um, in fact, my wife was told at the last meeting in December that there was no plan three. Um, and, and now, we know that Regulation 264-2 does allow for plans to be modified um, following the community comment process, um, but from the perspective of Old Bridge Estates, when your entire community has been surprised, they thought that they wouldn't be affected at all, and then all of a sudden, after two public um, comment sessions, they're told, oh no, that's not the case. To us, that's not a modification. That's an entirely new plan because it's a new change that's coming to Old Bridge Estates that we did not, we did not expect during the public comment process. Um, we did not, after that period, a week before Christmas, we received no official email. Um, it was up to people like my wife and other people from the Old Bridge Estates community to spread the word um, via Facebook um, to kind of let people know. And here we are the first day back from winter break and um, we're trying to pull this whole thing together, and still there are people at Old Bridge Estates who do not even know officially that our neighborhood is potentially on the chopping block to be split up and moved to other, um, to be moved to other elementary schools or portions of it. Um, before I go, I also wanted to highlight there are other issues of Plan 3A, particularly with the sections um, related to that small sliver, 20 students projected, that would be moved from um, Old Bridge, um, in Old Bridge Estates from Springwoods Elementary to Lake Ridge Elementary. Um, again, it's only 20 students out of 222 in Old Bridge Estates, so it's just 10%. It doesn't much do much to solve capacity issues at either Springwoods or Lake Ridge Elementary. Um, again, we now would have to send three buses instead of two. That's a separate one. And again, these 20 kids would be the only kids who would have to go from Lake Ridge Elementary and then to Woodbridge Middle. They'd be a class of their own. Thank you for your time, and again, Happy New Year. Thank you. Rachel Freeman. Hi, I'm um, against plans three and 3A. Um, I'm gonna piggyback on a couple things that they said. I was at both meetings, and during the second meeting, um, I believe this lady alluded to the fact that there was a plan three and three A in the works. And Dr. Cartledge um, somewhat scoffed at that. And um, lo and behold, there was a three and three A in the works. And I knew nothing about it, nor did our community. And I'm talking on behalf of the Bridge Point community that is currently in the Old Bridge Elementary School boundaries. We are a very small slither of a community and both plans three and 3A is going to split our community. My children play with my backyard neighbors. Our backyards come together. We're not different communities, different neighborhoods that share backyard. Our neighborhood shares backyards. They want to take these homes with all my children's friends, keep them in Old Bridge, and they want to take us, our homes, on the other side of the backyard, and move us across Old Bridge Road to Lake Ridge Elementary. They want to bring two school buses into our neighborhood for two different elementary schools. My children play. I don't know who your friends were in elementary school. My, my friends and my children's friends are people in the neighborhood and who they meet in the elementary school. You take away their friends from the neighborhood, they're going to meet people at Lake Ridge Elementary School. You cause a problem because those kids are going to want to cross over Old Bridge Elementary School, as crazy as it sounds, and go see their friends on the other side of Old Bridge. 
You're causing a safety concern. It's happened. I'm not making this up. It's happened. So I'm, I'm voting for, I would like, I can't vote, I would like Plan 2A to keep our small neighborhood, small Bridgepoint neighborhood, in Old Bridge Elementary boundaries. Thanks. Thank you. Tara Turner. Good evening, my name is Tara Turner and I'm here um, to talk to you about the Westridge boundary. I'm in the Occoquan district. Um, you should have a handout from me. It looks like this, if you can just reference that um, back and forth as I'm talking. So um, I'm here to talk to you today about 123 children who are going to be systematically isolated um, by all three of the plans that are currently on the table. We really believe that this has been unintentional um, but we can't ignore it as parents, and this is something that can be easily rectified. If you can look at the map that's on the middle right-hand side of your handout, it looks like this. And just to show you on the big map where we are here, what you see outlined in black is the outline of um, the Westridge HOA boundary. <laughs> Though everybody within those, um, that black outline is zoned for Woodbridge Middle School. And outlined in red, you can see the little island that has been created from our neighborhood um, that is going to be sent to Springwoods Elementary. Little Eloise wants to stay at Springwoods, and we'd like to stay at Westridge. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I really think that there are some, some ways to make this happen, um, and we've talked about them. You'll hear from other Westridge parents tonight. Um, but this little island that has been created, these kids are going to be sent to Springwoods Elementary in a sea of kids who move on to Lake Ridge Middle School. Our kids are zoned for Woodbridge Middle School. And so we're really creating this systematic isolation of kids who are going to be pulled back and forth. Um, between peers. So they would become their own little island, um, making it difficult for them to form lasting connections um, with others their age. And we already know this to be a very vulnerable stage of life. As you heard someone say earlier today, suicide is the leading cause of death in adolescents, age 15 to 18. So this is, a, this is something I can, I can guarantee that every single one of you are sitting here today because you wanted to make a difference for kids. And sometimes the bureaucracy of things get in the way, the politics get in the way. But right here, right now, you have a chance to take, take this little sliver, this little island. There's, there's solutions being presented to you right here in front of you. Um, and this is something that is achievable. This is something that we can fix. And we don't want to be systematically creating um, and, and isolation for children. And this little red section, just a little fact, is the lowest income um, area of our HOA. And so these are kids that are more likely to be from single parent homes. They're more likely to have households with two working parents. And we know that a lot of people have that. But when you systematically create a situation of isolation for them, they may not, the parents may not be as available as they need to be. Not every child is equipped to cope with an isolation like this, and we can change this. You can change this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mike and Wendy Haddock. My name is Mike Haddock. My address is on file with the clerk. This is my wife, Wendy, and we're speaking on the boundary change proposal. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the board, we ask you to come to a decision on the 16th in the best interest of what's important to us as parents, families, and homeowners. Our daughter is a second grader at Old Bridge Elementary. One version of the plan keeps us aligned with Old Bridge, but two would move us to another school. After attending both town hall meetings and reading the committee's final report, we are left wondering why. It is most certainly not a capacity issue. All three proposals stabilize Old Bridge Elementary at 90% capacity and keeping a neighborhood the size of ours within the Old Bridge boundary is not going to have significant impact. The committee's report presents very balanced and engineered figures, but it absolutely fails to address issues important to us as residents, homeowners, and parents, which should also be very important to you as our elected representatives. As homeowners who specifically bought a house because of location and schools, we're asking, 
Who has looked at how this is going to affect our property values if we realign to a school that is further away and lower performing? As parents, we ask how is this in the best interest of our daughter to move her from a high-rated school where she excels to one that has a 40% performance gap according to published data. All we can see coming from this based on what's been presented is a significant step down in the quality of education our daughter will receive and that's unacceptable, especially when there's no justifiable reason for it. Our neighborhood should be kept with Old Bridge as was intended. It stays well within the capacity level of the school. It does not adversely affect our property values. It has little impact on your demographics and it doesn't force us to accept potential hardship by forcing us to look to other alternatives to preserve the quality level of our daughter's education, which by the way, should have been a primary factor all along, but seems to have been lost in the noise. Please give this careful consideration. We don't think a case has been made to reboundary our neighborhood away from Old Bridge Elementary and ask that it be kept that way in any plan you approve. We believe a child's education should be the number one priority of this board and the entire school system as a whole. When you look at these plans in detail, we strongly urge you to ask yourself this question. Would moving these children be in their best interest? If you cannot answer yes with strong, supporting, factual evidence, then we feel you must leave the children in their current school. The priority must be on the children, not statistics and perfectly uniform bar graphs. Instead, the children must be our focus. We urgently request our neighborhood remain zoned for Old Bridge Elementary, which is done in Plan 2A. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Elizabeth George. My name is Elizabeth George. I live at 3499 Beaver Ford Road. I'm a resident of the Old Bridge Estates community. I have a sixth grader at Woodbridge Middle School who spent all of his elementary career at Springwoods, and I have a second grader at Springwoods. Um, I am in favor of Plan 2. A or Plan 3, as 3A takes 20 students, including my second grader, who to my knowledge would be the only second grader removed from Springwoods Elementary School and would send them to Lake Ridge Elementary School. He is currently zoned as a Woodbridge Middle Schooler, so when he would go to sixth grade, that's where he would go. And to my knowledge, none of the other Lake Ridge Elementary students would go there with him from his class. Um, I. Have t I'm a former Prince William County um, strings teacher. I taught at five of these elementary schools along Old Bridge Road. I know they are excellent. Um, and so I think at the community meeting, many people got up and said, we love our school, and, and we love our school too. And I think that speaks to the communities that they have created. I think that speaks to being together as a community. Our community is, is wonderful, just as the woman said earlier, you know, the kids that have share a backyard are gonna be separated from each other. We spend time with people on the other side of Beaver Ford Road because our side is, is so small. Um, we currently have two elementary school students who get on that bus. Everybody else lives on the other side. So we go over there to spend time with them. And I think that um, the communities that have been created here speak to both the schools and to how a community can make a school great and how a school can help make a community come together. So I would ask that you either that either the changes be made to 3A, that those 20 students stay at Springwoods, or that you vote for um, 2A or 3. Thank you very much. Thank you. Robert Buckley. Hi, my name is Robert L. Buckley. I live at 2514 Pembroke Court in Lake Ridge, uh, Virginia. Um, I believe the whole boundary change thing is a sham, a travesty. Uh, it pits school against school, and, and, and right now it forces 300 students from Rockledge to go to different schools. Rockledge is an excellent school. The parents, the staff, the students have worked really, really hard to make it a school of excellence. It has, a, I believe, stability is the success for uh, any education. There's many other options left to uh, for filling up these uh, empty classrooms and stuff in Antietam and stuff like that. You could um, expand the amount of languages at Antietam to attract other parents into that. No school should have to be bused 
and stuff like that out of their neighborhood. My child here, my, my six-year-old, is looking forward to being in the music department at Rockledge. She's um, looking forward to learning how to swim in the second grade, and she's, she's very sad about leaving Rockledge. Rockledge um, does many things for the community. They're involved in the Santa Parade and also the, with the Westminster Senior Group. Also, um, many of the parents who are staying at Rockledge are not aware that they're losing a vice principal with these changes, losing the mu music teacher, who is a great music teacher and has brought a lot of learning to the school. Um, also, we're gonna lose a art teacher and also lose a learning disability person. It's better to have some of these classrooms for special needs. We're lacking, and the county is lacking behind in detecting earlier students with learning disabilities. And I've seen Spanish kids coming in from in midterm and they are put in, uh, one autistic kid from Peru was put into a normal class, and another kid who didn't speak one lick of English was thrown in to a third grade without any, um, the teacher being able to speak. Spanish. Thank you, Mr. Buckley. Thank you. Um, next, um, Michael Butler. Good evening. Uh, my name is Michael Butler. I am a resident of the Lake Ridge community and a proud Springwoods parent. I'm not here tonight to tell you an opinion on the plans. My home isn't affected. In any of the plans that are published, my daughter goes to the same school. My son will go to kindergarten in the same school next fall. I'm more so here because of what I've observed over the last several weeks. I keep hearing the words, it doesn't make sense. I keep hearing people asking, why? I don't understand what's happening to my child. Why are we leaving this school? I love where I am. It, it's confusion and a lack of understanding. There's parents and all of you that are sitting up there care the same amount about these kids. We each care about these students as, as our own in our communities. What we don't have is the transparency that's been in the plans. There's a lot of transparency around the reaction. I can give a comment, I can send an email, I can attend town hall, and maybe my feedback's heard. Maybe the walker stays with the school. Maybe the neighborhood isn't sliced. But we shouldn't be talking about differences in plans. Those are just reactions. We should be talking about the process that produces the plan. If I were in your shoes, and I'm not, I don't envy it, I would want to look at the process, the methodology that led to the creation of a plan and say, is this good? Does this reflect my values? Does it make my community feel good? Because if it doesn't, the plan comes from it needs to be viewed with skepticism. Not that it isn't, that it lacks integrity, not that it isn't mathematically sound, and it may still very well be the best of a set of bad answers. But until our community and, and each of you has that level of insight into how the plan comes together, we're left reacting to plans. I, I don't want my daughter to change school, she loves it. She loves Ms. McKenzie's classroom, it's fantastic for her. But if she had to change, I'd want to know. I'd want to look at a process that said, this leads to the best outcome, or at least a good outcome, for the people who live around me and live in other neighborhoods. And I could rest a little easier with that. And I hope, and I'm here talking to you about this tonight because my family's not affected in this one, but they might be in the next one. And in the next one, I want to be able to look and understand what went into that decision, and so I can say, you know what, I don't like it for my family, but I like it for the community in which I live and it's what's best. So I encourage you, if you don't have that insight into the methodology, if you don't have it into the, into the process, don't approve the plan. Demand to understand the methodology and please share it with our community so we can understand too. Thank you. Thank you. I'll call the next 10 speakers if they can come up to the front. Uh, Malika Vickers, 
Rebecca Jovich, Pawasha Cocker, Clayton Medford, Sarah Trevino, Gabriel Pola, Sharon Pomeroy, Ron and Nadine Ferlazzo, Delena McBride, Sylvie Buckley, Keisha Smith, Elizabeth Francisco. First will be uh, Malika Vickers. Okay, um, we'll go to Rebecca Jovich. Good evening, I'm Rebecca Jovich. I'm at 3564 Eskew Court in Old Bridge Estates. Um, I'm a resident currently zoned for Springwoods, which is one of the schools that's undergone a 13 classroom addition with construction this year. I'd like to request your support for Plan 2A or Plan 3, which are also in the committee's final report as the most preferred plans um, from the committee. These two plans allow for students who sat through construction at Springwoods to stay at their school. They've raised funds for their new STEM lab. They've raised funds for more one-to-one -one technology, and they should be able to stay there and benefit from those efforts. This school is their kid, our kids' family, it's their community, and it's their safe zone where they have parents, adults that they've known for years and they can look to as a safe adult figure. <clears throat> as you've heard already a few times tonight, the third plan, Plan 3A, does not abide with the criteria of Regulation 264 for Springwoods. Specifically, the number five criteria is to avoid splitting small neighborhoods and the number six criteria is to attempt to improve geographic progression of communities from elementary to middle school. However, under this plan 3A, Old Bridge Estates is divided, a small neighborhood, and 20 students are moved to Lake Ridge Elementary School. <clears throat> My concern about this is that all of Lake Ridge Elementary is zoned for Lake Ridge Middle School. However, these 20 kids from Old Bridge Estates are zoned for Woodbridge Middle School. So my sons will move to Lake Ridge Elementary with virtually no one they know, and then in a couple years, move to Woodbridge Middle School with no other kids. So you all can imagine the anxiety of starting middle school, already tough for most kids, and then top that off with having no friendly faces with them. So I feel this situation is completely avoidable. Springwoods is not over capacity, and these kids have virtually no effect on the demographic variables which were considered in the planning, and they have minimal impact on the enrollment capacity at either school. So again, I'd like to request your support of Plan 2A or 3. There's no reason students should be moved out of a school that's not over capacity or moved to an elementary that doesn't align with their assigned middle school when the current elementary is not and will not be over capacity in any of the proposed scenarios. I understand last minute revisions were made because Occoquan parents complained that they were being moved when their school was not over capacity and this change is now reflected in all three plans. So I ask for the same consideration for my neighborhood to be put back with Springwoods in all three plans. Thank you. Paul Washa Cocker. Clayton Medford. Sarah Trevino. Uh, good evening. I'm Sarah Trevino. I, uh, my daughter attends Rockledge Elementary School. She's a first grader there. And for the sake of transparency, in all three plans, my family stays at Rockledge. But when I learned about the plans and the effect that it would be having on my school community, but also the whole of the Lake Ridge community, I felt like it was my obligation to speak against all three plans, specifically how they affect the Rockledge uh, community. In all three plans, we lose 50%, almost 48% of our current students. And we will be having students come in from Occoquan, but not enough to fill our building to the point that we won't be losing essential staff members. We will be losing some of our music program, some of our art program. We'll be losing a halftime counselor and probably a vice principal. That's not a school I would want to work in. Not having a vice principal and only having one full-time counselor, that seems like a lot. 
So I'm very concerned for my daughter's sake at the state her school will be left in when all of these children are moved out. I'm also concerned about the process as many people have spoken about this evening. It seems to lack transparency. We've got to give you lots of feedback, but we don't really understand why these plans were made, why you decided to build onto the buildings that you did. Um, and we just get to sort of deal with the aftermath of it all and try to advocate the best that we can for our families. I ask that you take a little bit of time. I don't know if you can do that. I mean, you're the board. You probably can do a whole lot more than we can. Um, but to take some time before you take this to a vote and maybe look at a different plan. There were changes made after we were told no more changes could be made. 80 students get to stay at Occoquan, which is wonderful for Occoquan. It's a great school community. But we're wondering why maybe we couldn't keep 80 students who are currently attending Rockledge. If they can keep some of their students, well then, why can't we keep some more of ours? It seems like this process has been very rushed. It's happened over a holiday where not everyone is able to be present and have their voices heard. I think that if you can take the time to bring the committee back together to maybe come up with a fourth plan that better meets the needs of our school community, that would be in all of our best interest. Thank you. Gabriel Pola. Good evening. <clears throat> uh, my first point is, uh, did these meeting uh, really help us? Are our voices really gonna be heard? And will y'all consider what these parents have to say. Um, the second thing I would have to say is how long has this plan been in place, in place and why are we just now hearing about it? And like she said, why is it being rushed? Um, there is, uh, Dr. Cartlidge said last time to a Westridge parent that you can't say Westridge is your school because it's not your school, it's Prince William County School. Potomac Shore is a new community that's being, that just got built. And on their advertisement, on their billboard on Route 1, it says houses, starting in the mid 300s on site school. So that gives you a opportunity to say, well, hey, how about we move there so we can have our school and be in the community? The board does not want to consider community when it is community that it matters in this whole process. That's what our society is built on. That's what America is. My neighbor can count on me and I can count on my neighbor. There was another thing said by Dr. Cartledge that the, that the school was built over there by the uh, Chin Center because it's premium land on Old Bridge. Well, I live off of Old Bridge, okay? So the lot that I bought was premium land. Does that not, not take into consideration? I'm, I'm, I'm paying premium dollar. So my, my tax paying dollars has a voice in this free education. The other point, my, this is my last point. My, my, my proposal is suspend the plan. Suspend the plan entirely. All students that attend their schools, let them stay at their schools. Any first, any first household students, if they have a kindergarten starting this upcoming year and they live in these proposed boundaries, let them start at these new schools. But if they have, uh, if they start at this school and if they have a sibling coming to start, let them stay. Let us worry about the transportation. We'll get our kids to where we need to get. We don't have to bus them. We can find out how we're going to go. Nine out of 10 people that live in Woodbridge have cars. You cannot live in this county and not drive, OK? It is, a, it is something that is necessary. I ask that you really consider what we are saying, because we have all elected y'all, OK? We go to the polls. We elect the people here for our voices to be heard. So I really would like for y'all to consider our kids' future. And when I mean our future, uh, their future, their mental health. As we as parents, we try to give, we are delicately putting their foundation together. It is a delicate process, and you are trying to uproot their foundations, and it's not right. It is not right. Please consider the mental health of our children. Please consider the effects that may have, that they may have. Because not all kids, just like adults, not of us are built the same. Some handle change, some don't. Some hold on, some let it go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sharon Pomeroy. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Sharon Pomeroy, and my address is on record. I come to, I emailed the board. I don't know if you've all received my email, but it comes with a pretty map, and I um, passed it along here so you can see. I'm standing here before you um, to talk about zone 349. This is a little zone that has been cut out, and is all three plans are zoning them to um, Lake Ridge Elementary. I do not live in this zone. If you see that little mark, it says me down there. I live across the street. <laughs> but these people, um, their backyard, literally their backyard aunt, is Antietam. And the other side is Lake Ridge Middle School. And the other side, I mean Antietam boundaries, that's what I mean. And the other side is Old Bridge, Old Bridge Elementary. So they live the closest to Old Bridge Elementary, but our zone currently at Antietam, and then they're going to be rezoned to um, Lake Ridge Elementary according to all three plans. I asked the board to consider to uh, have this small group of kids. It says in all the paperwork that it's gonna be 29 kids. I believe there's about 15 kids that live in that small community. They also have a playground that is connected with the green part around, so they will be cut off to their community, like the gentleman said. Um, they just don't have anyone physically around them, so I feel geographically that they should stay in Antietam. And I just wanna let you know, I moved from kindergarten to ninth grade every year, different school, and I'm here to tell you, it's okay to be in a different school, it's great. And I stayed in the same county, and where I was, it's districts, it wasn't county. So I stayed in the same district, going to all the different elementary, middle schools, and I am a great person here today talking to you to say it's okay to move schools. But I ask that you keep geographically this group in because of their geographic location. Thank you. Thank you. Ron and Nadine Ferlazzo. Okay, Delena McBride. Hello, my name is Delana McBride. I live on Harbor Drive and I'm part of the Rockledge community. I wanted to speak tonight so I could ask the board to strongly consider extending the timeline of the boundary decision process. <clears throat> this is a very important decision that is being rushed and pushed through without enough thought. The committee that was put together to develop these plans was given very strict parameters to follow. So none of the map options are really that much different from each other. In fact, for several schools affected, there is no change at all between the map options. I'm extremely concerned also that there were changes made to the maps um, after the committee had left for the holiday break and they were not voted on. Um, these, plan these changes specifically favored Occoquan Elementary um, which is great for Occoquan Elementary, and I know that Rockledge, as well as others, would like to have that same consideration to increase the capacity um, for our school as well. Um, also, I was concerned, I had been, I know that there were some committee members that tried to bring some outside of the box ideas to the committee meetings, and they were shut down and their ideas weren't heard, not as much less considered. Um, that was very concerning to me because there were a lot of really smart people on that committee that probably had some wonderful ideas that they were never allowed to even share. Um, so it seems that an extension on the process would be beneficial for everyone, but specifically for Rockledge, it would be nice to figure out how to keep more of the current students. All three proposed plans have almost 50% of the current student population leaving, and this would cause a huge disruption to the positive school climate that the administration and teachers have worked so hard to establish. This would also drop the Rockledge population below 500 students, and that number would affect staffing in a huge way. Um, the funding for staffing, the um, administration would have to make really tough decisions um, and cut amazing teachers, making them half-time positions like music and art, um, potentially the, the gifted program, um, the extra PE teacher, nursing staff, um, administration, extra support staff, not to mention just general education teachers. This could be devastating um, for our community. I, um, I am not 
personally affected by this plan as far as having to move schools. But I am very concerned, as an, I'm also an educator, about what this could potentially do to Rockledge. And um, it's just very scary. Um, this would result in a lot of reduced opportunities for our students. So please do not rush through this important decision-making process. Um, I ask you to reject all of the plans and to reconvene the committee and come up with some smart outside-of-the-box plans that will help all the kids be able to stay if, as, 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 much, as many of them as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Sylvie Buckley. Thank you for the opportunity to speak for all of you. As a mother, and I'm working at cafeteria hostess at Rocket Elementary School, I'm not allowed to talk, but I still have one more to go, so I need to talk so you can hear my voice. Thank you. When I labeled my son very premature 26 months, I didn't know that it would affect my son's education. When Patrick went to Rocklets, we didn't know that anybody, so we didn't realize that he had learning disability, and she have to repeat the kindergarten. But it was a blessing because the next kindergarten was Mrs. Jago Belny, with on the first grade, Mrs. Simpson, second grade with Mrs. Johnson, third grade with Miss Knott. My son is perfect. And then without any help for nobody, no counselor, no nothing, and then she got reward. She got eagle of the month, and then he got, it will be on a roll every period without helping nobody. That's the way Rockledge is helping us. But I understand a lot of parents said that, yes, my kid is miserable. Yes, my kid is miserable too for the whole year. And I push my son to go to the school because he doesn't have any friend at all on the fourth grade. And the teacher is brand new teacher, CPHD teacher. Okay? And then she's worked at the Georgetown University at Washington, D.C. And when we bring it, she just look at me like, hey, that's the way we stay, Mrs. Buckley. How I feel? Nothing. So I complain with my husband because I'm concerned. Because like a lot of parents said, like, yes, if you move your kid, the kid is miserable. Yes, I push my kid the whole year. Miserable at the Rocklets. But what are we going to do? Nothing. Just go and sucking in. Okay? And on the fifth grade, when my son went with Ms. Travis and Mr. Stutman, I want Mrs. Oden over there to become my, our son teacher. But since Patrick got learning disability, so Patrick have to go to Mr. Stutman and Ms. Travis. I cannot believe how growing he is. When we got the graduation, how many rewards that we got from school. And Ms. Travis and Mr. Stamat did perfect. And everybody said like, wow, your premature now is getting, you know, success. Thanks God for that. So I want to make sure that my Shannon doesn't go through whatever Patrick go through because all of you changed this. I'm not against the school. For me, new school, new everything. We have to move on as a parent. If I can beat my cancer right now, everybody, so beat it. So you guys give me more problem. I cannot say it nothing to you guys. I cannot sue you guys. But just help me so beat my cancer. So later on, like, I'll thank be you. healthy through it the whole year. Thank you, so, Mr. Buckley. Thank you. So. Keisha Smith. Hello, my name is Keisha Herbin Smith, and I um, my address is on file. I live in the Somerset um, neighborhood in the West Ridge community. At this point, you've heard practically every argument against the proposed plans. We've all argued that families bought their homes in West Ridge with this school in mind. All three proposed plans split our, split our neighborhoods that are physically located within the West Ridge community. The proposed plans will increase traffic levels within Westridge, and they will adversely affect the school progression of our kids. Systematic separation of an existing neighborhood by income is unacceptable. Relationships that have been forming since birth 
are now being broken with no regard for how this could affect a child's future. It's the last point that I want to dwell, delve into a bit. While I never personally dealt with rezoning and redistricting as a child, because I lived in the country and you went where there was only one school. So um, my husband was placed right in the middle of a very similar situation to one we have today. In 1987, my husband's family moved from Atlanta to Greensboro, North Carolina, as his dad had just gotten a new job. Uprooting from Atlanta was not an easy thing to do, leaving friends, anxiety about the unknown, etc. But that move was essential in his parents' mind for a better life for their family. So when they moved there, they did not know that the neighborhood that they chose was in the midst of a rezoning battle, which would move kids from his neighborhood school and bus them almost 40 minutes across town to another school to create more diversity. My husband's neighborhood ultimately lost the battle with the school board. And while parents were enraged and threatened to move their kids to private schools, they were encouraged by the fact that even though the board had to make an unfavorable decision, they showed empathy towards the kids in the neighborhood by ensuring that the bonds forged on driveway basketball courts and during summer swim meets would never be broken. All of the kids, not half or portion, but all of the kids were bused across town to a new school. My husband now realizes, due to this current situation, that his positive progression as a youth could have been altered during those times. As the new kid, he already had an uphill battle in finding a niche in the neighborhood, and had his neighborhood been divided, he could have been whisked away to another school, where none of his newfound friends would have been attending. It's unthinkable now as several of these kids became lifelong friends. Flash forward now, and now our two sons are faced with a similar fate. While all the elements are not the same, the one thing that remains constant is our request to keep our neighborhood together. We as a community are requesting an alternative plan to ones that have been proposed. So the West Ridge neighborhood remains at West Ridge Elementary School. The school board has the ability to fix this, and we have solutions that would work. One example would be sending Mays Quarter and Reed's Prospect to Springwoods as a whole group, rather than uprooting just a portion of our neighborhood. We've put a petition in with the um, clerk. I ran out of time. Thank you. Elizabeth Francisco. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Francisco. I am a resident of the Somerset community in Westridge. Um, I'm here to ask the school board to reject the three proposals that are being presented to you. All three of the plans presented to you break up the Westridge community. They exclude the townhomes of Highland Chase, Windsor Park Apartments, and the Somerset condos from attending Westridge Elementary School. Westridge is a unique community. We are a community of families that offer friendship and support. We still enjoy our ch chili cook-offs, trunk or treats, and family nights at the pool. We are old school, and for my family, many things would not be possible without the help of this community. I have tried to find positive in these proposals, but I cannot find a single benefit to the students, their families, our community, or even the school. By removing the townhomes and condos, including the neighborhood the neighboring wealthier communities in Westridge Elementary, you have taken a school already lacking in economic diversity and made it worse. Studies show that students that attend less diverse schools have a harder time adjusting to the real world and miss out on life lessons and skills that can only be learned from being exposed to a more diverse environment. The current plans 2A and 3A will take the economic diversity from 21.5% to 14.4%. Looking at plan three, I think the committee may have realized this mistake and tried to correct it by taking diversity from a community closer to Penn and Carydale and increasing the economic diversity to 28%. It seems crazy to me that they wouldn't use our portion of the neighborhood to diversify Westridge. Instead, they chose to bus kids 3.7 miles to attend a school when they have a school 1.5 miles away. We are also busing in kids from neighboring communities like Bacon Race Road to attend Westridge that are commuting past three other elementary schools to get to our school. Reed's Prospect, the community next to the county complex, has direct access from their community via Chansford Road to Springwoods Road and Springwoods Elementary. That part of the community is 1.7 miles to Springwoods and 3.1 miles to Westridge. This is putting kids on the roads longer and putting them at higher risk for accidents. By sending these communities to other schools, you will be keeping them off the main roadways and decreasing traffic on the main roadways like Prince William Parkway and Old Bridge Road. All of these additional miles they are traveling is a waste of time for the kids, their families, and a waste of our ta taxpayer money. 
Those of us in the townhomes and condos are most affected by economic changes. We are the ones whose property values drop the quickest. So by, by removing us from our community, you are also depreciating our home values. The single family homes in the higher price growing communities next door would be affected by this change much less. So what are the numbers telling me is that we are willing to exclude the local, local, lower economic families to accommodate the wealthy. I also understand that with growth that is expected in Reed's prospect in May's quarter over the next several years, a school like Springwood that has added multiple classrooms would be better prepared to take on that growth as opposed to Westridge, which has not been added to. I'm asking the board to please make the de best decision and keep our community together. Thank you. I'll call the next 10 up if they would please come up to the uh, front. Richard Jesse, Dan Hartley, Warren Davis, Teddy Fano, Tom Burrell, Kelly Martin, Langston Carter, Amy Lopez, Chrissy Falls, Kim Fleming. Good uh, evening, board members. My name is Richard Jesse. My uh, address is on file. First of all, I'd like to address a, a misconception that some people have. The school board members here did not create these three plans. These plans were created by the school system and the committee. The school board members, because of their own rules, have basically said they cannot be involved in the creation of the three plans. I think that should change. The other thing is that the ownership of the plan right now was the school system and the committee. Now it is moving to the ownership of the school board. You have the opportunity to address the concerns of the parents. And you have the opportunity to create a plan that you feel fits the need. I have been to many of these meetings, and I can tell you, I don't remember any boundary meetings where at the night of the vote, the members of the board changed the plan. And the committee had no, the community had no opportunity to discuss these changes. So you can look surprised, but if you check and go back and look at the records, Almost every boundary meeting at the night of the, the vote, they changed to, they changed the boundary plan. You have to understand the board here, you will get blamed or you will get praised for whatever you do. And you can accept one of the three plans or you can modify the three plans or make a different plan but you now will become responsible for it. They will not blame the committee, they will not blame the school system and Dr. Waltz, they will blame you. And this is an election year, so I think you should be listening to that. Thank you. My recommendation is that number one, that you expand, extend the time to have one other meeting a public meeting that people can hear what your new plans are if you make one. So that's one thing. The second recommendation is the school board needs to change this process. You should be involved in the making of the plans rather than waiting until the last two meetings to hear it and then. And this whole system that occurred during the holiday, I use a nice word, sucks. Dan Hartley. Mm -hmm. uh, Warren Davis. Uh, good evening. <clears throat> My name is Warren Davis. I live at 12558 Cantilever Court. Um, I'm with the uh, Bridgepoint community and in support of uh, Plan 2A. Um, there's a couple of reasons uh, that I support this. Uh, it's not as eloquent as the Westridge, uh, Westridge uh, group, um, but the school size, from what I understand, uh, the classroom size is what we're looking at as part of some of these decisions that can be made. We represent a very small part 
in the plan 2A. It's very little um, road entering the community and the cul-de-sacs that are on and off of it. Uh, from what I understand, I think there's about 40 students or so that look to be affected the numbers according to you guys. We as parents, we're not kind of did our own count. We're about half that. And if you spread that number out, K to six or K to five, that's, that's a very insignificant number to look at if we're gonna be number crunching as far as how we're gonna compare those for a reason to move and displace families. Um, uh, the other reason uh, would be a safety concern. Uh, I'm a police officer, been so for about 19 years in Washington, D.C. And at the very start of my career, part of it was school crossings. The vast majority of those kids walk. And the things that I've seen from, from drivers just aren't paying attention, a uh, kid isn't paying attention, there's just horrible outcomes. And to have our kids um, subjected to potentially crossing Old Bridge, walking to school, even with their parents. And I've seen adult pedestrian accidents with their children. It's not just the children. That The concern is just the fact that everybody knows you do everything right, and if you're driving, you do one thing wrong, and the other person hits you, or whatever the case may be, it's a, it's a horrible outcome. So part of that is a public safety issue. Part of it is a safety issue for parents walking with their kids, as well as it's not just, you know, if we're looking at a nice day, sometimes it's going to be inclement weather. Sometimes you don't wake up, you know, with the alarm and you're gonna walk your kids, you miss the bus or whatever. Um, another public safety issue is gonna be the fact that you're uh, introducing more schools, uh, school buses into that, into that zone. Um, and the third or fourth part that I'd like to add to this is as far as our decision-making process goes, everybody wants to sit back and be intellectual and factual, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But we're humans and we're made of emotions and emotions do drive some of our decisions. And part of that emotion is what we share as a community, whether it's gonna be uh, sorrow or joy or whatever we bond with as far as our community goes. And schools are part of that community. And if, if we're gonna set the example for our children and, and set them up for the future, it's looking at how we're gonna zone those schools and how we're gonna keep those families and those kids and those friends together. Um, I also would like to echo what Ms. Freeman had said, that my kids live off of that same cul-de-sac and either play with their kids or cross those same yards. And, and that's the boundary that isn't seen is, is what's there with the community, what we share, and what's being taken from us and kind of dictated to us, again, without this transparency. So those are my thoughts uh, in support of Plan 2A. Thank you. Thank you. Teddy Fano. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> good evening. Uh, my name is Teddy Fano and my address is on file. Um, I represent the West Ridge community. I spoke at our first meeting, um, whenever that was, um, and I got some responses back from um, Representative Jesse, uh, thank you, and uh, Dr. Cartledge. You know, I, I can harp back on what most of my, you know, West Ridge um, uh, partners have said. Um, I don't want to do that. I just want to harp on what the, the gentleman who, you know, was a little bit passionate about what he said, um, and in just the transparency of, of the whole process needs to really be out there, um, because it's, 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 it's not only disheartening, it's becoming very hurtful. You know, I have a daughter, um, we have two daughters, my wife and I, and one is seven and one is four. The four-year is soon to be going to Westridge. Obviously, she can't go now with these plans in place. Um, and she's asking me about her, her childhood friend, Amari, who and her have been in Westridge since kindergarten. Well, Amari stays in the boundary because Amari lives in the uh, single family homes across from the pond or the pool that we all go to. It's a walking distance, it's a five minute, actually it's three minutes and 57 seconds from my house to Westridge. So now you're taking me from my house into a car or a bus on Old Bridge to get to Springwoods. Now, I don't know anything about Springwoods. I'm sure it's a great school for the community that's there. In fact, we've had some really great parents mentioning how great they love their school. I just don't want to separate it. It just makes it very hard for me to go back to my daughter because she called us this evening while we were sitting here because she's aware of what's going on. She's like, Daddy, did you, did you make it happen? Because Daddy always fixed stuff. This seems to be something that I can't fix. And I'm urging you guys to please listen. I don't know what the processes are. I don't know if you guys are listening. I, I wouldn't take anything away from you all, but as I'm looking at all of you all faces, what do you guys tell your nieces and nephews? Because I'm sure you guys have nieces and nephews in this county. What are the conversations with them too? It's, it's hard. It's very hard. That's why I bought a house there. That's why my wife and I bought a house there. I've lived in Virginia and went to George Mason University. My parents live in Fairfax. I'm a Virginia kid, Northern Virginia kid. 
I work in Tyson's Corner. That's why I bought my house in, West, in, in that West Ridge community. And again, just to hop back on it, it just seems like you guys are just separating us and it's just that small group of people that you guys have taken up. Now I'm hearing numbers as there were 20 students now being removed from Springwood. How did you guys come up with the 20? Did you, are you guys replacing those 20 with 20 from West Ridge? What's the process? We need to know that. Please, reconsider your decisions. Either suspend it, I know it's a hard job for you all, or kind of push the dates out so we can really have a true decision here for our kids. Thank you. Tom Burrell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Tom Burrell, and I'm the president of the West Ridge uh, Swim and Racquet Club Homeowners Association. I currently reside up in Fairfax County for, since 2009, but I've owned a property in West Ridge since 1988. Uh, I've been actively involved in one position or another on the Board of Trustees since 1993. So I think I've got a, a feeling for what the community wants. I'm here tonight representing the 1,533 families that currently reside in, in Westridge. In particular, the hundreds of families impacted by the boundary change proposals that will be pre presented to you tonight. I want to express our substantial opposition to all three of the proposals being brought forth because all of them cut a piece of Westridge uh, out of the boundary for Westridge Elementary. I don't know that I can add anything to the eloquent comments that have been said tonight, and I want to thank my Westridge neighbors for, for turning out. I appreciate it. But let me uh, make a couple comments. First, our board and community understands that Westridge Elementary School is not our school. We don't own it, we don't maintain it. It's part of the entire system of the elementary schools for which you are responsible. However, it is our school and has been since Westridge, the Westridge community was developed in the mid 1980s. We have a vested interest in having sufficient and state of the art infrastructure and quality education for our children. Our parents and PTA are engaged and committed to ensuring that our school is doing its best for our children's futures. The current proposals being brought forth will substantially degrade the quality of life we enjoy in Westridge. A, a plan that excludes any portion of the physical community known as Westridge in order to bus in children from homes miles down the road sends potentially devastating direct message to children in those neighborhoods that they do not belong. It creates inequitable and unnecessary distribution simply for the sake of meeting some demograph demographic goal, something we view as unacceptable. Our board has for the 18 plus years I've served on it always stri strived to ensure the highest quality of life for our community. For many years prior to the implementation of the school board's policy to allow high school students to attend uh, any school that they wanted. Our children grew up and attended the same series of schools from elementary through middle and into high school. And now with the current proposals being uh, brought forward, we're gonna break that down even further at, at the middle school level. Uh, let me just summarize, I only have a few seconds. We recommend that you take a hard look at all three proposals. And the one question I'd like you to ask is, what if what if you don't take Westridge out of those plans? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Kelly Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the uh, school board. My name is Kelly Martin. My address is on file with the clerk. I'm representing the Old Bridge Estates community as its uh, representative from its board of directors. Uh, OBE has recently organized on the Colgan Pool issue the parkway site location, and we understand the difficulties involved with this process and the emotions involved with the parents. Uh, looking at the criteria, as mentioned, one is avoid splitting small neighborhoods. OBE is 862 homes wedged between 1,500 for Lake Ridge, uh, West Ridge and over 7,300 for Lake Ridge. By definition, we're a small neighborhood in our larger neighborhood. Uh, this plan 3A would also carve out 
um, as I mentioned, 20 people, sending them to a different geographic progression, that would violate the criteria in 264.2. Another criteria, <coughs> excuse me, is to facilitate efficient transportation. Plan 3A would take those students up Smoketown, eastbound on Old Bridge in the middle of rush hour, whereas now they get to turn left on Old Bridge and go up Spring Woods counter to traffic. So Plan 3A would violate at least three criteria stated in 264.2. As also mentioned, Spring Woods after the additions and no boundary will go to 70% roughly capacity. So you're taking 20 kids out of the schools where they're in, when there's plenty of room for them, and they're building more room for them. It just doesn't make sense again. So the plans don't, other plans don't split these similar neighborhoods. Old Bridge should not be treated unfairly. So on behalf of the Old Bridge Estates neighborhood, if had to, we would choose 2A or, or plan three. However, as also noted, we feel that the process uh, has not been transparent, particularly with the additions of plan three in between the last public hearing and this meeting today. So our recommendation is that the board move to delay the vote and reconsider the plans. And I would suggest that the community be given scoring against their criteria for the different plans so they can understand why the decisions were made. Thank you. Langston Carter. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Langston Carter, but most of you probably know that by now. I live in the Occoquan District. Uh, my address is on file. For the last two years, I've been advocating for students in our community. I've spoken at these meetings numerous times, and I've sat and watched in disappointment. As a former Prince William County School student, I knew there was no way I could change the system from the inside as a student, and that's one of the reasons I left the public school system. Now, I wouldn't come here to criticize you tonight without offering a solution, and that solution is something I call equitable spending. You're failing our community and our students, particularly students of color. When spending equitably, you look at the state, the economic state of all of our public schools and their students, and then you focus the money and resources on the schools that have more students who are facing economic disadvantagement. Students who come from families who have money and resources can provide the resources they need to succeed. But our schools should be providing resources to the students who are economically advantaged and facing poverty. If we want to offer all students a world-class education, it's time to stop investing in pianos and start providing them with the resources they need to succeed academically. Right now, we're setting them up for failure. Do you think students' chances for success should be determined by their parents' income? Because I, I don't. Now, there's a simple solution to that answer, but the problem goes deeper than our funding. I attended Woodbridge Senior High School for just under two years, and in those almost two years in a pre-AP English class, I was never once assigned a single book by a black author. Only one short piece of writing, a poem by Langston Hughes. I, too, sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes. But I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen, then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I, too, am America. This poem holds a special meaning to me, not just because I'm named for the man who wrote it, not only because it was the only piece of writing I was assigned in school that was written by somebody who looked like me, but because it reflects my very reason for being here tonight. I intend to reach out to each of you following this meeting, and I hope we can enter a dialogue that might include students of color who are currently in Prince William County Schools and those who have been in the past so that we can develop a more inclusive curriculum and a budget that sets all of our students up for success. And uh, as somebody who has absolutely no stakes in this current situation, I think the plans need to be reevaluated so that students attend schools in their own communities. Thank you. Thank you.
Amy Lopez. Good evening, Dr. Waltz, Chairman Latif, and members of the board. My name is Amy Lopez, and I have been a resident of Lake Ridge since 2005. I am here tonight to address my concerns with respect to the boundary proposals for the Prince William Parkway Elementary School and classroom additions throughout our region. Thank you for your attention and your time to this unbelievably difficult and very emotional matter. I am deeply, deeply concerned about the recommendation. Tonight, I came in with the concerns over plans three and three A, but after hearing many of the parent cries, I'm concerned with all of them. The plans three and three A moves a few streets within my neighborhood in order to meet, as stated by committee members, capacity requirements that I just don't see. My children attend Woodbridge High School, Lake Ridge Middle School, and my youngest is a first grader at Old Bridge Elementary School, our neighborhood elementary school. Our home resides in the plans zone 360 of the Prince William Parkway boundary recommendation. And along with zones 359 and zones 376, we are currently under consideration of being moved across Old Bridge Road to Lake Ridge Elementary School. Aside from the emotional ties our neighborhood families have to Old Bridge Elementary School, moving these three zones, which estimates less than 40 students in the 21-22 school year, would move a very, very small sliver of homes within an entire neighborhood who is currently all attending the same school. While it can be said that, they, that any school will promote community, our neighborhood is our community. Our neighborhood attends the same school, and thus we are all part of the same school community. These kids play in the woods together. They walk to school together. I believe splitting these zones from Old Bridge Elementary School would damage the community our neighborhood has worked so hard to establish. Our kids can safely walk to and from Old Bridge Elementary School without even leaving the safety of one continuous neighborhood. For the sake of the children who will be affected by this needless change, in order to maintain the well-being of these fewer than 40 projected students, as stated in the three-year plan, which doesn't affect capacities whatsoever, we're talking K through five, I respectfully request that all the plans under review which require our very small portion be moving to another school not be considered as a viable or thriving option. When I walked in tonight, I was going to urge you to approve Plan 2A, but after hearing all of these parent voices crying for no change, I urge you to hit the pause button. Thank you. Thank you, you Ms. Lopez. Chrissy Falls, Kim Fleming, oh, I'm going to go ahead and call the next group up. If they would like to come up front would be Sonja, Dorland, Stuart Davis, Elizabeth Hernandez, Heather, uh, Heather, Heather, uh, Heather Abney, Mir Yahya, Barbara Laramore. Uh, next would be Kim Fleming. Did I say that already? So she's not here. Sonja Dorland? Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I'm about to lose my battery. So I borrowed my friend's phone here. Okay. Was it ready right away? Sorry. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Sonia Dorlin. I live in the Occoquan District, and this is not my first radio here. You guys have seen me on a regular basis. Um, my address is on file. Happy New Year to all of you. I am here to speak about the Parkway boundaries, boundary zones. I'm asking that you vote for Plan 2A because a small piece of the community that may possibly be taken away <clears throat> Sorry, from Old Bridge Elementary which was, has achieved School of Excellence for the past 17 years. Um, 
because we have an amazing uh, principal, Anita Flemings, and amazing teachers, staff, and our wonderful supporting families that we have at OBE to help make that possible. I have many friends at Bridgepoint, which are some of the ones that Ms. Lopez talked about <clears throat> in the zones. I have frequently walked to and from this community, and I know the families also walk to and from their homes to OBE. It makes no sense to take the small piece of community and move them across Old Bridge Road to Lake Ridge Elementary School and take them from a school that they can walk to and move them to a school that makes it more dangerous for their children to go to. I ask that you do not rush through the plans and ask, especially if you do not live in the Occoquan District, that you um, go out and drive in these areas and see how close these communities are to their elementary schools and how the communities are divided so that you can get an idea instead of just looking on the paper. Because I actually feel for the, the Westridge people, I can see that even on the map as where the Reeds Prospect is not even a part of that community, but they still yet go there and they're being sliced out. Um, <clears throat> I also ask, um, I'm sorry, I lost my place after I said about Westridge. Uh, I have friends there too. So <laughs> please listen to the families that have taken their time away from their families here tonight and to take their considerations into your voting process. Thank you. Thank you. Stuart Davis. Good evening. Stuart Davis from 3720 Beaver Ford Road and Old Bridge Estates. I'm also the president of the Old Bridge Estates Homeowners Association. I've had three children either go through or graduate from the Prince William County system. Like everybody else from Old Bridge Estates, I'm here to talk about Prop Proposal 3A. It splits Old Bridge Estates in half, splitting neighbors, the summer swim team, the Cub Scout pack, and friends from each other. What it also does is split the community economically in half. We have about 900 town, townhouses and 700 single family homes in the community. This proposal puts the townhouse families at Springwoods and almost the entire single family home group at Lake Ridge. What we're afraid of is this gives the committee two chess pieces. One, the townhouses that are primarily low English proficiency, low income, higher minority that they can put to balance one school and the single family homes that are just the opposite with high English proficiency, higher income, lower, lower minority that they can use to balance another school. I would hope that wasn't the purpose, but that seems to be what it's setting up for in the future. Which brings me to my main point. I don't understand what the point of this balancing the numbers across the schools is supposed to accomplish. That seems to be the primary criteria on the, on the plans is to balance the numbers across the board. I don't believe that having a 45% free lunch versus a 50% free lunch in a school is gonna improve the education quality or a 73% minority versus a 70. I would ask that you come back with a table these plans as they are and come back with a plan for that tries to leave the neighborhoods where they are, which is what everybody seems to want, and quit worrying about an arbitrary number of English proficiency, income, and minority levels at the school. If you have a problem at the school, fix the school. Get another principal, get some better teachers, spend some money on that problem instead of spending all this time and money on gerrymandered boundaries that are just making everybody mad. Thank you. Elizabeth Hernandez. Good evening, I'm Elizabeth Hernandez. I have two daughters at Rockledge Elementary, and I'm here tonight to ask you to please ask the staff of, the, of Prince William County Schools to reconsider all of the boundary change plans. Um, I have two concerns primarily with all of the plans that have been presented. 
The first is that Rockledge will be significantly and inequitably impacted by all of the plans that have been proposed. Nearly 50% of the students will be moved from Rockledge Elementary. The staff uh, will be significantly impacted and um, this is inequitable. Um, this, this is, I, my children will probably, unfortunately, have to move from Rockledge and I uh, feel so sorry for parents and students who are still staying at Rockledge with the impact that will be significant um, from losing an assistant principal, a counselor, um, moving to a half-time music teacher and a half-time art teacher. The other reason that I believe that we should, we are asking uh, for these plans to be reconsidered is because traffic on Old Bridge Road is going to be significantly impacted by all three of these plans. So right now the boundaries are drawn so that they're perpendicular to Old Bridge Road. So right now I just drive across the street to drive, drop my children off. I drive right across Old Bridge Road. Um, that makes it really easy for them to attend the music program that um, goes on in the, in the mornings. Um, and it makes it really easy for me to get to school at night for evening programs as well. I work in Fairfax County. My commute is about an hour each day. And when I think about moving to Antietam, that means that I'm going to need to drive west down Old Bridge Road, drop my children off in the morning, and then drive back east with the rest of traffic. Occoquan parents are going to have to do the same thing. Um, and some other parents who are going to be attending Antietam that are even further east on Old Bridge are going to have to do the same thing. I called Supervisor Anderson's office and spoke with her about this. And, she, and I asked her, I know that uh, the Board of County Supervisors has been working to mitigate traffic concerns on Old Bridge. Um, I asked for her opinion about this change and how uh, her office might be able to advance measures to mitigate the traffic. She said that plans were about a decade out. So we have about 10 years before any traffic plans or any decongestion of the traffic on Old Bridge is going to occur. So I think we should not have any plans that are going to significantly impact traffic in the ways that um, all three of these plans do. So I would ask for um, the vote on January 16th to be delayed. I would ask for um, the staff to please reconsider and present the community with other plans. I love the idea of having an objective measure through, uh, as was suggested, that, that perhaps there was a, a standard that people could um, objectively choose one of the plans to be in support of. Um, and I really want to believe that this system works. Um, and I would just implore you to, this is not going to be the last boundary change that happens. It would be a really great idea to get it right this time. Thank you. Heather Abney. Good evening. My name is Heather Abney and I'm, I'm not going to speak about boundary issues tonight. A lot about that. Um, I am the proud principal of Woodbridge Senior High School a Prince William County School of Excellence. It is hard to believe that three years ago today, I was about to embark on what would be the most challenging, yet most rewarding chapter of my life. A day that can start off with a student coming up and giving me a big hug because she's in the top 5% of her class and she just got accepted to UPenn, to a few years later, a few hours later, walking down the hallway and having a student come up to me and say, Mrs. Abney, I think I will take you up on that offer to get a bag of food from the food pantry. A student who I had just finally, um, I was finally able to get him to um, realize that we're there to support him. And in a meeting where we were having a tough decision, is Woodbridge the right school for you? Or do we need to look at the GED or look at an alternative placement? He said to me, Mrs. Abney, my mom's dying of cancer. My dad's not in the picture. I don't have anyone. I looked at him and said, we're here for you, and we're going to support you. Just this morning, I saw him walk into school with a big smile on his face. So that's what life as a high school principal is like. On January 3rd, 2016, I walked into Woodbridge Senior High School, one of the largest and most diverse high schools in the state of Virginia, and a school that had been previously led by great leaders, a school that, beca that because of their leadership, ran like a well-oiled machine a school achieving academic success, and a school embraced by the incredibly talented students, the dedicated alumni, the local businesses, the families, and most importantly, the entire Woodbridge community. And I think a lot of them are here. I think this is like the Woodbridge community here. 
I had big shoes to fill, but I also knew that three mentors would be by my side every step of the way. Three mentors who love Woodbridge as much as I now do, and three mentors who continue to watch me from afar, guiding me and supporting me through every triumph, and most importantly, through the challenging times. Pam Brown, Alan Ross, and David Huckstein, the three former principals, thank you. I know that very few board meetings take place without the mention of Woodbridge Senior High School lately. You've heard from so many, but you haven't heard from me. I thought that as the new year gets underway, that tonight would be the perfect time. The turf field appear appears to be a popular topic, and I want to formally thank you for approving the stadium project for our school. I'm already working closely with John Winley and John Mills as the planning is underway. Like any construction project, I know there will be challenges we face and tough decisions we have to make. As the leader of the school, I am looking forward to the partnership I have already established with facilities and working through whatever issues come our way. As I mentioned to Mr. Winley recently, it's a challenge to make everyone happy, and I have certainly learned this in my three years as a principal. However, if we continue to focus on making decisions that will posit positively impact our students, then I know we are moving in the right direction. I know I'm out of time, but I just wanted to formally thank um, all of you for supporting me as a principal. Um, I want to thank my community for bringing uh, concerns to my attention, for sharing their feedback along the way, and most importantly, for trusting me to lead our school. With that being said, I want to thank Dr. Latif, uh, Mrs. Jesse, everyone on the school board, and most importantly, I can't forget Dr. Waltz. Thank you, Mrs. Um, Dabney. Yeah, I just wanted to say, yeah. you, you may not remember, but years ago when my son was a toddler, um, at, I saw you at the Chin Playground. And you took the time, he's 13 now, you took the time to talk to me, not only about education, but about my family. And I still remember that, so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mir Yahya. Mir Yahya. Barbara Larimore. I got distracted. Everyone was talking about the boundaries, and then she talked, and she was so good. Okay, focus. Okay, so uh, Lake Ridge Elementary School and the PTO president at Lake Ridge Elementary School. Um, it's a wonderful school. We have wonderful leadership. We have great students. Um, I know... <laughs> that lots of people don't wanna come, but I just wanted to start off with saying that we have great students, kids, resources, um, so please don't be afraid to come if you uh, happen to get moved there. Um, the, ba the boundary planning um, has, has been rushed, I will agree, um, and I do agree with uh, Ms. Relihan that we should extend um, until not the next school board meeting, but the, the meeting after to get those plans that dropped after Christmas um, some more time to, for, for the community to be able to um, talk about them, discuss them, and, and be transparent about it. Um, I'm going to keep it breezy, keep it short, because it's been a long night. But please come to Lake Ridge if you can. Um, we welcome you. And uh, please take your time and think about these decisions. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll move to 1701 Student Housing, uh, Level Associates. I think I'll... We'll, we'll um, take a five-minute break while they get ready to present. Thank you. Next up, it will be 1701 Student Housing, Elementary School Attendance Area Recommendations, 21920 Prince William Parkway Elementary School. Denise Hebner. Good evening, associate. Dr. Latif. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Elementary School's eastern side, right? Got it, thank you. All right. Good evening, Dr. Latif, members of the school board, Dr. Waltz. Um, before we get started with the presentation, I would just like to take a moment to thank our Boundary Committee for all of their hard work. Um, I know that they worked very hard along with Mr. Beavers and Dr. Cartledge to gather feedback and use that information to make thoughtful decisions. So again, thank you for their time and their hard work. And I will turn the microphone over to Dr. Cartledge who will go over the presentation for you. Thank you, Mrs. Hubner, for the introduction. Good evening, Chairman Latif, members of the school board, Dr. Waltz. It is a pleasure to be here this evening to present to you the recommendations of the Prince William Parkway Elementary School Boundary Planning Committee. I'll begin the presentation with a brief discussion on the current and projected capacity utilizations in our project. Then I'll move on to mention the future capital improvements that are scheduled in this immediate area along Northern Route 1 corridors and the Old Bridge and Prince William Parkway corridors. 
Subsequently, there will be an overview of the boundary planning process. And lastly, I'll present the recommendations of the boundary planning committee. The presentation will first shift its focus towards the existing schools in the greater Lake Ridge and Woodbridge areas and their respective capacity utilizations. On your screen now is a map that demarcates the attendance areas of the 16 existing elementary schools within the scope of this project. These will be affected by the opening of the Prince William Parkway Elementary School and by the construction of classroom additions at Lake Ridge, Springwoods, and Tedham Elementary Schools. Each of these will be adding 13 classroom additions. It will also be affected by the construction of a 10 classroom addition at Miniville Elementary. The tabulation of student enrollment projections are presented here in the presentation and these are based on the current attendance areas for each listed school. The program capacity that we've provided is 2019 program capacity and that is what is being used for the planning purposes. It was updated to reflect all educational programs that were present at these schools on September 30th of 2018. I do want to mention that a second update was made to Occoquan Elementary's program capacity after the boundary planning process began. Shortly before winter break, it was brought to our attention that the square footage of classrooms that were associated with a classroom addition in 2003 were erroneously printed on the floor plans that we had in our files. As a result, it turns out that four classrooms were actually large enough to accommodate general ed instruction. It was the result of this, rather than a public preference or request, that prompted us to update the capacity of Occoquan Elementary by 79 students. Moving on, I'd like to also point out that among these 16 elementary schools, there are 61 portable classrooms present that are being used for educational purposes. When planning sees the presence of portable classrooms, it suggests to us that the number of students attending these schools exceed what the permanent structure is able to accommodate. It's a little bit easier to look at these figures graphically. Uh, these numbers are reflecting what was just shown to you in tabular form, but it's very clear to see that um, among these schools, they're overcrowded. Uh, they're not just projected to be overcrowded, they are overcrowded. We have 61 trailers here. Nearly one in three portable classrooms in the entire division are found among these 16 schools. The problem is here today, and we're gonna be coming with proposed solutions to leverage the additional space that we are gonna be welcoming next year. Uh, just to kind of bring your attention to some of the most overcrowded schools, Old Bridge Elementary is projected to be 140% of capacity next year. Penn is close behind at 132% and Occoquan is at 130%. Occoquan's is based on the new updated capacity that has those 79 seats added to it. In terms of overcrowding at the elementary level in Eastern Prince William County, planning has tackled this with the support of the school board in a three-stage process. Stage one consisted of the opening of Wilson Elementary School in 2016. In 2017, Kilby Elementary School was replaced with a larger school on site that added capacity. We also opened Covington Harper Elementary School and welcomed classroom additions at Henderson, Neapsco, and Belmont. Stage three will conclude next year with the opening of the Prince William Parkway School and classroom additions at Springwoods, Miniville, Antietam, Lake Ridge, and Lee Sylvania. These capital improvements total approximately $200 million and add over 4,000 elementary seats to Prince William County. As you can see, there's clearly going to be space that with smart boundaries we can reduce the number of portable classrooms significantly. The Parkway School is going to be located on the Parkway at the intersection of Kenwood Drive. It is currently under construction. It's going to add 749 seats by itself and will be ready for the 2019-20 school year. 
The photo on the right is an architectural rendering of what the school will look like upon completion. The educational programs offered in the new school will be consistent with the core ones that are offered at all elementary schools in Prince William County. Now we've heard from a number of speakers this evening and we've heard at the community meetings that just leave the boundaries as they are. We're adding space, let's not adjust boundaries. If we were to do that, the graphic on the screen now shows us what the capacity utilization would look like with the current boundaries, but adding the additional space. For one, the Parkway School does not have an attendance area if we do not adjust boundaries. And two, you can see that Antietam, Lake Ridge, Springwoods, all these schools where additions are being constructed are around the 65 to 70 percent utilization. Meanwhile, these other schools where the 61 portable classrooms are present are still significantly overcrowded. We're going to shift into the part of the presentation that talks about the process. And we've heard this evening about some questions regarding this process. What does it look like? Was it carried out um, as identified? School Board Policy 264 gives a general overview of what the boundary planning process looks like in Prince William County Schools. The Code of Virginia gives a public school division the power and authority to establish pupil assignments to its schools. Regulation 264-2 was essentially the roadmap that helped us navigate this process and gave guidance to the Boundary Planning Committee. Over the course of the next few slides, I will discuss these in greater, greater detail. Policy 264 allows for the creation of a boundary planning committee when working with elementary and middle school projects. Throughout this process, public input is gained uh, by a, a multitude of ways, including community meetings, the boundary planning committee, emails, phone calls, and chance interactions. A final report was prepared that includes three recommendations for the school board's consideration. The committee's role in this entire boundary planning process has concluded with this report, and that is provided to you on board docs and is available to the public online. We've also posted it on our boundary portal. It's important to mention that school boundaries are ultimately based on the need to provide for instructional effectiveness and the health, safety, and general welfare of all students. Looking closely at the regulation, these were the criteria that guided the Boundary Planning Committee. Each boundary plan will attempt to balance enrollments at the affected schools within plus or minus 15% of the total capacity utilization for the first three years the boundaries are effective. They're also tasked with minimizing the number of times that a specific geographic area is reassigned within the past several years. The facilitation of efficient transport of students is considered, avoid splitting of small neighborhoods, improve geographic progressions of communities, and consider the demographic balance. Now it is near, if not absolutely impossible, to optimize every single one of these criteria for every location in the scope of the project. Therefore, there is judgment built into the process, there are preferences, there's a response to public input, and as a result of that, the three boundary proposals are upholding of the regulation, and they're not in violation of it, but they're certainly not optimized at every location throughout the project. The last one is considering the demographic balance. The Boundary Planning Committee considers three demographic variables, limited English proficiency, economically disadvantaged, and self-identifying minority. Awareness of these data provides for the drawing of boundaries that embrace the diversity in our school division. On this slide is a summary of what the Boundary Committee's responsibilities were. They reviewed the initial plan that was drafted by the planning team. They analyzed student enrollment, school capacity, residential development information, and together they collaborated and created a series of boundary plans. Of those that they created, there were three that they chose to be provided to the school board for its consideration. They also held two community meetings, and after each meeting, they went back, deliberated, and made modifications as they saw fit. 
On behalf of the Office of Facility Services, I would like to personally thank each member of the Boundary Planning Committee for his or her hours that were dedicated to this process and for serving as a conduit between their neighborhood, school communities, and this planning process. At this time, we're going to briefly switch over to the Boundary Planning Portal and walk through the three plans uh, just as an opportunity to give a plug for this in case those at home or in the audience have not visited this already. The best way to identify how these plans could potentially affect your residents is by going to the fifth tab. On this tab, you may enter your address up here. And once you do so and hit enter, a little pop-up will display and it will tell you what your current assignment is and what your assignment is based on these three plans under consideration. And I am told we upgraded our bandwidth. So in essence, I'll just try to walk through this simply and tell the story of how this unfolded. The preliminary plan, which in one aspect was a plan to eliminate all trailers. Within the first three years, based on the preliminary plan, all schools but one were going to be under 100% capacity. In doing so, we have those parameters listed, and not all of those were weighted evenly. The one that was weighed the most was balancing enrollment, trying to most leverage the new space that we are welcoming next year. So the preliminary plan was presented to the public and we received a significant amount of input on the features of it. One of the most salient features that was of concern to the Boundary Committee was that there were walkers being reassigned to another school that made them then have to ride a bus. That does not uphold the efficient transport of students. So the committee went through and identified these places and reassigned them back to their existing school to make them walkers. They also looked for other opportunities where existing bus riders could then become reassigned as walkers to a neighboring school. So we'll just kind of walk through the features of Plan 2A. And just for information, the purple line this is the current boundary right now. So we are looking center, this kind of turkey looking object is the current boundary for Penn Elementary. Then the yellow shading is the Westridge Elementary proposed boundary in Plan 2A. The communities here north of Prince William Parkway, uh, there's Mays Quarter, Reeds Prospect, Coventry Glen, Hickory Knolls, in Plan 2A, in an effort to reduce overcrowding at Penn, they are proposed for reassignment to Westridge Elementary. Now, all of these are connected. It's a system. So when students come into a school, there's a shift. Our new space that we have are at these three additions along the old bridge road, Lake Ridge, Springwoods, and Antietam when making this adjustment to reduce overcrowding at Penn by bringing these neighborhoods to Westridge, the Glen and a portion of Westridge's HOA, this is <coughs> Windsor Apartments, uh, there are townhouses, these were proposed for reassignment to Springwoods Elementary. So we can see the purple outline of Springwoods Elementary. As we move down the old bridge road, we bring some of the students from Antietam Elementary along Mohican Road over into Lake Ridge. In the preliminary plan, the residences along Creel Court were also proposed for reassignment to Lake Ridge. 
these individuals are actually walkers for Antietam. So this is an instance where the Boundary Committee identified an opportunity to keep them at their current school and essentially keep walkers to enhance the efficient transport of students. As we move further down the Old Bridge Road corridor, Antietam Elementary, with their addition, takes on some of the students from Rockledge. This is Rockledge's current attendance area. So this is Old Bridge Road here. We have Colby Drive uh, right through here that does split um, Old Bridge. These residences are reassigned to Antietam. And the few students that are located at the southern part of Rockledge's attendance area are proposed to the new school, the new Parkway School. As we continue to move down Old Bridge Road, Rolling Brook and parts of Occoquan, the town of Occoquan, are proposed for reassignment to Rockledge. With the 79 additional seats that we found with Occoquan Elementary, the process was not to create a new plan or to change something that was beyond the intent of the Boundary Committee. What happened or what transpired was combining the configurations for Occoquan Elementary found in Plan 2A with that found in Plans 3 and 3A. Both of these, central to these plans, was the sentiment to keep more of Occoquan's existing students at Occoquan Elementary. So in doing that, 70, approximately 79 additional students current students of Occoquan were able to remain at Occoquan Elementary. As we move across the 95 corridor, we have Kilby and Belmont. In essence, after the addition was constructed at Belmont, there was still additional space for it to accommodate more students. And in doing so, Woodbridge Station was brought into Belmont Elementary. This, redu this reduced some of the soon to be overcrowding at Kilby Elementary despite the larger school that was constructed on site. As we continue to move south down the Route 1 and 95 corridor, Vaughn Elementary's attendance area currently is all of this. It extends up Prince William Parkway and most of the attendance area is west of 95 while the school itself is east of 95. There is an opportunity here to reassign this portion of Vaughn's attendance area to the new Parkway School. In doing so, Vaughn's attendance area then shifts over to like Marungpsco Acres. Um, you have the Bayside area. Those are reassigned to Vaughn Elementary. As we continue to move south, we have Potomac View and Featherstone Elementary. In the preliminary plan, the A streets, the A stage streets like Arizona, were proposed for reassignment to Potomac View. The committee identified that these are walkers for Featherstone Elementary. The portions of the current attendance area that have like Idaho Street, Oregon Avenue, these students are already provided busing transportation to, to Featherstone. So by reassigning these streets rather than the A streets to Potomac View, students who are riding the bus would already be riding the bus and could be reassigned to Potomac View in an effort to reduce the overcrowding. Miniville Elementary is also having a 10 classroom addition constructed. The H streets were proposed for reassignment to reduce overcrowding and to better leverage the 10 classrooms being constructed at Miniville. As a result, Carydale's overcrowding was reduced. And our last school to discuss would be Penn Elementary. We said that that was one of the most overcrowded schools and the portions of its attendance area north of the parkway were proposed for reassignment to Westridge. Now, there are a lot of moving parts to this. In the final report, the communities that are proposed for reassignment are listed. 
that's available on the Boundary Portal. It's also available on Board Docs. The changes between Plan 2A and 3 and 3A are somewhat minute, so we'll briefly go through those. The first one, and perhaps most visually obvious one you would see, is that this portion of Penn's attendance area north of the parkway, so this is um, Hickory Knolls, Reed's Prospect, Mays Quarter, there was a wish and preference voiced by many residents here to remain at Penn Elementary. The Boundary Committee identified a solution that reassigned portions of Penn's attendance area east of Ridgefield Road to be reassigned to Westridge Elementary. There was also an enhancement on the demographics of Westridge Elementary. They were brought to be more representative of the region rather than what they were previously with the configuration found in Plan 2A. Another key distinction between Plan 2A and 3 and 3A would be the residences along Cornice Place were proposed for reassignment to Lake Ridge. I hear a why in the audience and it's a perfect time to address it. With the balancing of enrollment, we are tasked with a plus or minus 15% rule on total utilization. With, a, with an addition on Lake Ridge and not bringing more students into the school, the school falls below the minimum threshold of approximately 79%. As we're moving along, the other key distinction between 2A and 3 and 3A are the reassignments of the southern part of Old Bridge. We heard from residents that Jenny Lane preferred first and foremost to remain at Old Bridge Elementary, but if they were to be reassigned and reassigned to the Parkway School, that the portion of the attendance area along Falk Lane also be reassigned as well. In doing so, we also heard from a number of residents at the Woodbridge Mobile Home Park and voiced their preference to remain at Old Bridge. In Plan 3 and 3A, you can see that the attendance area for Old Bridge is now modified to include the mobile home park and to include Amasal Estates and Holly Leaf Court area to remain at Old Bridge. The other key distinction is that the H streets that we previously identified as being added to Miniville Elementary are then proposed for reassignment to the Parkway School. Our last plan is Plan 3A. Again, speaking to the sentiment uh, voiced by those in attendance at the Boundary Committee meetings and in the emails that we received, there was concern about the capacity utilization of Lake Ridge Elementary being too too low. Therefore, in 3A, as another configuration brought to the board's um, attention for consideration, was to bring more students into Lake Ridge Elementary. In this configuration, part of Old Bridge Estates, currently associated with Springwoods Elementary, is proposed for reassignment to Lake Ridge Elementary. <laughs> and lastly, in Plan 3A, the configuration that we saw in 2A with um, Mays Quarter, Reed's Prospect, those are brought back to Westridge Elementary. So at this time, we're going to switch back to the PowerPoint presentation to finish that. Provided on the screen are the associated student enrollment projections and demographic compositions for each school. In a few slides, we will present this information graphically so it's a little bit easier to digest. Again, recall that the Regulation 264-2 charges each boundary plan with a balancing of enrollment of plus or minus 
that is based on the 94.8% that is shown in the third year right here. So if every single school was balanced only on enrollment, it would be 90, each school be 94.8%. When we apply the plus or minus 15% rule to that, our range becomes between 79.8% and 109.8% of capacity utilization. We're gonna fast forward, we have the two A figures. We're gonna fast forward to looking at these graphically. Those are provided in the final report for your review. And so graphically, as I mentioned, 94.8% would be perfectly balanced among all 16 existing plus the one new school, 17 schools. As we can see in Plan 2A, 3 and 3A, most of the schools are brought below 100% capacity utilization by drawing the boundaries in any one of these three configurations. And I think that there's significant progress that we are able to show thanks to the Boundary Planning Committee. Recalling what Occoquan Elementary's capacity utilization was, recalling PINs, and now looking at what those are now, that's a significant enhancement. Continuing forward, we have provided side-by-side -side comparisons for you to try to identify just the changes between the two plan, excuse me, between the three plans by isolating two plans at a time. So we have 2A and 3 here compared of the schools that differed among those plans. We've also provided graphical comparisons for the demographic changes. In Plan 2A for limited English proficiency, the largest change was 9.6% decrease at Old Bridge Elementary. We provided the same information for the economically disadvantaged. Plan 2A had a largest change of 11.6% decrease at Old Bridge Elementary. Plan 3 had a 7% increase at Westridge Elementary. And Plan 3A had a 7.3% increase at Penn. For minority, the largest change was 11.6% at Old Bridge Elementary, 4.2% increase at Vaughn Elementary in Plan 3, and a 4.9% decrease at Plan 3A at Westridge Elementary. The Prince William Parkway Elementary School Boundary Planning Committee respectfully requests that you receive its report and consider approving one of the presented boundary plans. Plans 2A, 3, and 3A receive considerable support by the committee members to be presented for your consideration. When they were asked which of these were most preferred, the committee most preferred plan 3. Lastly, the committee also requests that you consider providing a transfer provision waiver for rising fifth graders as long as they provide their own transportation. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you for your time. Discussion, questions? Ms. Williams. Um, let me first uh, start by saying that I do recognize and understand the considerable amount of time and energy and effort that does go on um, in this boundary process. And it is not a fun process. Um, I don't think for anyone, but especially for your office. Um, having sat in this position for a while, I do understand um, what an interesting position this puts you in. In this particular case, and this is the first boundary that I've been involved in, where um, I am confused as to how we ended up where we are from where we started. Um, when we started this, I, I was very much in favor of, um, I'm still very much in favor of, of changing boundaries, but it was my understanding that this would benefit the Whippers District by carving out the top corner and new students, instead of being bused from all over, especially schools like Vaughn and Kilby, mm -hmm. 
they would be closer to where they live going to a school. Somehow we ended up with the majority of my district being affected. And the issue that I have is it, it becomes about equity and it becomes more than numbers. And like one of um, the citizens says, said earlier, it, on paper when we look at numbers and we look at how the boundaries lay out, it looks logical and it makes sense. But for me, this goes back to when, well, pretty much my existence in Prince William County, but really, truly, when we talked about um, shifting Occoquan to Belmont, and I spoke about that 2.2 miles, and how it could be five minutes or 45 minutes, and how members of my district, a lot of them aren't afforded the same opportunities because they don't have cars, or they work two to three jobs, or they, um, our immigrant families, or they're not aware of how, uh, that they have a right to advocate for themselves. And I feel like I'm right back where I started in that very same discussion. The why is because out of my district schools, I am aware of one of them holding a community meeting. And I went to it because it happens to be my son's school. Myself, staff, and the committee member were the only people in attendance. And it was held the day before holiday break, which happened to be the same night when I showed up that I found out about plan three because I was also at that committee meeting. I mean, the, the community meeting where we were told there was no plan three A. Being a member of the board, I completely understand things change. I, I get that. But I, I find myself siding more and more with the community from all aspects and even more so because this actually directly affects me. When I learned that there was a plan 3A and originally my son was going to be bused from a walking distance from Featherstone to Potomac View and then to go to the meeting and find out that he's no longer being bused, he's being a walker, which is what we asked. Internally, I felt kind of like, I wonder if members of my community now think that I've called you and said, hey, can you please move my kid back? That was a thought that I had. And then it made me think, well, I wonder what the rest of my community feels. They don't know. And that's deeply disturbing to me because I've sat here in this seat for six years specifically saying how hard it is. We don't have, and I completely respect when people come from their communities with their t-shirts and they've been organized. We don't have HOAs. I don't have members in my community coming with matching color t-shirts as much as I, I love them. I'm, and I'm always the person who says, please come. I want to hear good things. I want to hear bad things. I think it's critical that everybody has a voice. I don't feel that this is the case in this situation. I have asked on December 19th, I sent an email and asked that we delay this entire process to give everybody a better opportunity to be heard, um, to go back and look at these plans, because it's more than just numbers and paper. If we have families that only get to the school because they walk and they're no longer walking, or they don't have transportation, that's not just the makeup of the school, but it's the heart of the school. It's the volunteers in the community. It's the staffing. I know that there's a lot of, of my own people that I talked to in both the Occoquan District and the Woodbridge District and the Neasco District who are concerned because they're wondering, are there same teachers gonna be there? Is the staff gonna be the same? And it's different. If you're in a Title I school and there's only a certain amount of students you're gonna have in a classroom period, and now you're looking at not having those students, that's a, that's a completely different fear from a community that's being split in two. And I know we can do better than this. I, I absolutely believe that. I think that we haven't taken enough time to uh, reach out to all of the stakeholders involved. I would like to see if the Occoquan District has community meetings. I would like to see the Whippers District have community meetings. Knowing that my families aren't usually as fluid in getting together and, and they need, most of them are uh, English as a second language. Is, English is not their first language. so. It's hard enough for a lot of them to come up and feel comfortable to speak before the board, but as I said before, there's not even a bus stop for them to get here, to be organized, to speak before this board, to share their concerns. Completely understand, we have email, we have phone, I'm always saying that as well. But it feels unbalanced. And it, and it really bothers me in the sense too that some of these schools were just reboundaried in my district. Featherstone, 
uh, Belmont went through it, uh, Potomac View. Potomac View still, other than the reduction of trailers, still comes out overcrowded. I, I'm, I, I have a hard time understanding how this benefits that school. I know you, I can see that it does, but I, I don't, I still don't understand. And I'm the representative for that district. So I can only imagine how parents who aren't familiar with spreadsheets and bar graphs and different colors and numbers, because there's a lot of parents like that. They have no clue. Being a, a Prince William County homegrown person who was raised in Lake Ridge and went to Rockledge Elementary and was the opening class of Lake Ridge Middle School, and I know you guys are tired of hearing this, and went to Whipridge. I moved on purpose, no offense, Occoquan District, because you know I love you. So I didn't have to go up old and down Old Bridge Road anymore because it cost me money to get to my kid when he went to Rockledge because I had to pay $5 for every minute to climb up Old Bridge Road to get to him. Completely frustrating. Stressed me out as a single parent to the point I literally moved to the other side of town so that I didn't have to deal with that. That's a big deal. And that's me. So I know I'm speaking for a lot of people who live in the Occoquan District. God bless you for living there still. <laughs> I know that as a school system, the traffic is not our fault. Um, I'm sure Supervisor Anderson knows that I know that because I say it to her frequently. It, it, these are not new things, but I think that we all deserve um, a second look at this and to try to look at it not just from numbers, but actually what the human cost is. Because if you have stressed out parents who are getting to their kid and they're missing the, the music and the art shows and the programs and the opportunity to participate in PTA, which is still a struggle because a lot of schools hold those meetings at five o'clock or 5.30 and most of us who live here don't work here. And I know that because I've been working outside of this community my entire professional life. An hour back and forth and then I gotta fight traffic to get to my son. I'm praying in the car as a crazy lady that I don't hit somebody. I'm not aggravated by the time I get to the school. There's a, there's a huge factor we can't put on paper, but very much impacts all of our ability to educate and raise our kids. And that's a big deal. If you have an unhappy parent and I come to the school and I'm racing to get there and I've missed my sons, whatever, now I'm angry. Who knows I don't Kirk out on the next person, for lack of a better way to put it, but it's a, it is a big deal. And it's hard for all of us, I think, on this board when we deal with boundary changes because we don't all live in that district that's affected. But I, I very much would like, I'm begging the rest of my board that we give this more time. If you don't understand the geographic mess of traffic that is the very northern end of Prince William County, I encourage you to go drive it. And, and not at 3 o'clock, although 3 o'clock is a good example now, but at 6.30 in the morning. And not just Monday, but, but Wednesdays um, and every other Monday and every other Friday when the government workers aren't off because that makes a difference on traffic on the days when everybody's going to work, which is usually a Wednesday and a Thursday. And then factor that in that some people have elementary school kids and middle schools and high school kids, and they're going to three different schools all up and down one road that you have no other way to get off of. That S-curve, somebody gets in an accident on Old Bridge Road, you're done. You're not making it, period, hands down. There's no other way to get there. Uh, these are the things that make that difference. And, it, and it's busing, putting more buses on the road. That's, I mean, if we have to do it, I understand the frustration. I drive through Bayview every morning to get to my commuter lot. I watch one bus go this way to pick up elementary school students, and there's another bus coming at me. There's a lot of mornings I'm silently saying things that are not appropriate, but I'm understanding that I don't want those kids crossing the street. So I understand we do things as a school division that sometimes don't make sense to our parents. And I know there's valid reasons for it, but I think we can do better with this. I don't think everybody has been heard and understood. I don't think the community feels that way. And I know my district residents don't know. When I knock on their doors, they have no clue. And it just it's heartbreaking to me. And I don't want anyone to feel either that just because I have an elementary school kid who goes to Featherstone that I have more of a personal stake than my neighbor does or the person on Idaho does or the person on Belmont Bay does because it's equal to me. 
And I just wanna make sure that we've all had time to really understand this process. Everyone has really been heard. And I'm asking the division again, if, you ha if we could expand those community meetings to include the Whippers District and not just the Occoquan District. I mean, I know coming from my commute, there was a night when I think it was at uh, Whippers High School where I almost didn't wanna go because I thought about driving up Old Bridge Road from my house I was already at. And I was thinking, man, I really don't wanna do this <laughs> because of the traffic. Um, you know, I, it's a huge deal. It's, it's a financial, it's a mental toll. And if we're going to make this much changes and, it, and it's going to impact this many families, I think we can, um, I hope that we can take some more time and hear back from people, especially when it comes to 3A, because it did occur over the holiday break. And if I'm sitting on the sport, I didn't know till I showed up and thank God my principal had, um, enough foresight to hold that community meeting. I, I probably wouldn't have found out until after break either. And I'm not so sure that that's right. And I'm not uh, pointing fingers and saying you guys have done a bad job because I do not envy you. I do not want your job. Thank God you have it, not me. But I think we can do better as a whole working together. Ms. Jesse. Well, uh, let's say... She doesn't have parents who wear T-shirts, I do. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank the committee and members who designed the plan and that were being presented. Are there committee members here tonight? Would you please stand? I know you don't want people to know who you are. <laughs> I, I honestly, I really do appreciate the work because it's massive. Um, you know, I have been a principal for 20 years and been on this board for, I don't know, seems like 20, feels like 20. Um, but this has to be the biggest and most impactful plan, boundary plan I've ever dealt with. Um, we're talking about 10,000 students, 16 schools, four magisterial districts, and we're trying to do it all in one big swoop. Uh, it's just overwhelming uh, for me. We're talking about the Coles Woodbridge District the Coles Districts, the Neabsco District. Seemed like Occoquan, all of Occoquan must have come tonight. Um, and I, I want to give a shout out, which is kind of interesting, because one of my students from Vaughan, Gabe Poehler, I just want to tell you that I must have taught you well, so now you're here protesting. <laughs> I, I want to thank you for representing Vaughn. Uh, I, I am very proud of you. You know, you and I have history. I'm so proud of you and that you're such a great family person. That's just, and the other person I really want to thank is the man who um, comes every night and like Mr. Trenum and I think Willie Doach, loves Excel sheets. And so I have a color-coded one from Mr. Jesse. Uh, he does a lot of by, uh, you know, board members don't we, don't, we don't get to get staffers and people who can do all these reports. So I want to thank uh, you for listening to him and offering to meet with us to go over all of these sheets. Um, I actually wrote my notes because it's so important to me tonight. Um, students are being moved to and from every elementary school in Occoquan. Uh, that's a total of seven of these districts are my district. When we looked at this initially, my thought was, that we were looking at the new school on the parkway and we'd move some kids over there. 
I have three schools that have additions, Lake Ridge, Antietam, and Springwoods. I thought we'd move some people in there. And I ask, please don't, if you can, and I know Mr. Mallard and several of you, I said, try not to move the people who are already there out. And I remember either you or Mr. Mallard, I'm not sure, said, Lily, that's gonna be hard. I just felt like if I'm already there, and all of a sudden now I have to move, that's gonna be a problem. I've offered to meet with every school in my district, and I have met with each one of them I will be meeting with Rockledge tomorrow. I've tried to listen. I have driven during the holiday break. I've driven to these boundaries. I've looked at Cricket Lane. <laughs> uh, I went to 12803 Occoquan Road because this gentleman sent me a note saying, come to see my house, and I know why, because he's a hop, skip, and a jump from, from Occoquan Elementary, and his, he's not going there. Um, when I look at this, these were my three plans. One, I wanted a plan that would minimize the number of students being transferred from their base school. I wanted to determine if all of this hoopla and all these people, if there was a common thread of concerns from parents and communities. And I also wanted to look at the long-term impact of this. I have learned from the best. And I have to tell you, Mr. Trenum, they know how to do it. They get in there and they, it's, I'm a hands-on person, I always have been. This is my, what I see as the common concerns. Too many schools are being moved at one time, creating anxiety among parents and students. It's just too many. Parents are not being given time for feedback. The last, the last two signs were put on the website a couple of days before the holiday, and then they're just being presented. When I saw the plans jump up on and you're packing your clothes, you're getting ready to go to grandma's house, and all of a sudden, there's a boundary plan. Students in schools that are not part of the original plan are being asked to leave their school to make room for other schools. I just didn't anticipate that, and, and I understand why Rockledge, for example, at first Rockledge was losing 70%, now it's down to 50, if I'm a principal in that school, I'm thinking, whoa, that means I have new teachers or no teachers. I have teachers leaving. I have kids coming. I don't know these kids. I've got a plan for these kids. I've got unhappy people everywhere. Rockledge students are being asked to move further south on Old Bridge Road, I think, to Antietam, creating a traffic nightmare. Thank you, Gabe. Uh, Aquaquan residents who live on Aquaquan, 0.1 mile, that would be 128.03, that place. The town of Aquaquan, a historical site and a historic part of this school, are being removed from this school. West Ridge students are being moved to Springwoods in order to receive students from Penn. West Ridge was probably just sitting there thinking nothing's going to happen to us, and now they find that they've been moved out of their school so that others, others can come in. Same thing that happened with Rock Ridge. West Ridge students are asked to become walkers, and I went over there to look at Somerset, and you guys know it better than me, but it seems like there's no walk. There's, no sidewalks in certain instances, and it's a long walk. I clocked it, I looked at it. Uh, small clusters, uh, there are several small clusters. Cricket Lane, 
uh, Old Bridge Estates. Those people have been writing me. I've been writing back. Um, Mr. Cartledge, you know, uh, could you stand, please, just for one second? You know, I, I said to this man, I said, I think you are a nerd, <laughs> and you understand all this stuff, along with my husband, and Willie, and probably this guy. But this stuff is not user-friendly. If I'm a parent, I don't know if I really even understand it if I went in there. But you did a good job with it. And all the color codes is really, I just want to thank you because I, I, I honestly know how much work. So now finally my recommendation. Um, I think like Ms. Williams and the parents that we really need to look at the timing of this. Uh, the Aquaquan piece was very significant because I've been asking for consideration for Aquaquan Elementary to build something on that land, I think ever since I have been here. Now, and then I look at this graph, Aquaquan 156, like Lily, why are you asking that? Well, now I find out it's 129. So although the people in Rockledge, this Aquaquan thing, I think really will end up to your advantage because my recommendation is that you build something on the Aquaquan property so the Aquaquan people don't need to go to Rockledge. <laughs> and uh, most of you know me by now and Wayne Mallet knows me quite well and he knows that I'm very persistent. I want to thank you for saying to me, I will do uh, a study, a feasibility study at Aquaquan, but I would like for that to be considered immediately. And to that end, I have contacted the uh, planning office and they have given me this narrative of, of, how, of what we can do there. And I'm not gonna go through it, but I would like for it to be considered and I would like for it to be considered um, immediately. Um, West Ridge, I think the kids at West Ridge, somehow we need to come up with a plan that allow those kids at West Ridge um, to remain at West Ridge. And so with that, those are my recommendations. I want to thank all the parents and for coming and for us, I know that it's very difficult. You know, I was a mom also, but uh, I know how difficult it is. So with that, those are my recommendations. I recommend that we do have some type of um, extension or change of plans. Ms. Ralston and then Ms. Satterwhite. Thank you. Uh, I just want to apologize to you. I was not even aware that I thought it was three schools that were in this. I look up and there's nine schools? 16. 16, but nine. There are two, there are three in your, three in your district. Yeah, three. So that makes it quite interesting. Not because it's my school, but because we didn't know. Uh, that's, sometimes that happens. The last time that I talked to you and asked you to do something, you did it, and then I was really sorry for that because then that <coughs> turned out to be a fiasco. So what, we, what I'm really looking at at this moment is that because I just have a, a couple of schools, I have three schools out this time, which is different, and I appreciate you. Thank you very much. Um, I think that if we can figure out how I can keep as many as possible away from Penn at this point, because Penn is overcrowded and has a bazillion, it seems like, uh, trailers. So I'm more or less looking at that, and I understand we will be on, let's see, the add-on addition at Miniville, right? 
So we, yeah, go ahead. So in each of the plans, I'm sorry, you, speak up a little yeah, bit. in each of the plans, there are adjustments that allow for the addition at Miniville to either help Carydale yeah. or to be at a lower utilization itself, basically waiting for the growth that is projected to be occurring there. Do you possibly see us moving any more kids? I have Penn, Carydale, and Miniville. Are there any, is there any more movement in that district? Based on what the committee has recommended, mm -hmm. there are no additional changes that are being presented to you. Over the course of the next two weeks, the planning staff is available to be your asset to look at a variety of what-if scenarios. The proposals that are given to you are there for your consideration. You do not have to adopt any of them. You can make adjustments to them. You can try to combine some of them and we can work with you to go through all these what if scenarios. Okay, because I'd like to know what I can do to help at the school right next to me. I think that's you, right, Lori? Are you right next to me? Um, are you referring to like Vaughn? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Vaughn um, is sort of the I the parkway Vaughan. is in the middle mm -hmm. between my district and yours. Okay. If that's what you mean. Okay. And can I have a look at that? So if if it's of any help. Sure. Absolutely. Thanks very much. Thank you. Miss Satterwhite. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, I've been studying these for several weeks now, well, actually over a month now, and I've got several concerns. And first, like everyone else, too, I want to thank the committee. I want to thank you and your team for all the work you've put into this, because I know it is a lot of work. Um, and uh, I want to thank all the parents, too, for hanging with us and following plan after plan after plan, because I know it's a lot of work on you also to keep track of this and to watch your houses. Um, several concerns. Um, I'm concerned about Rockledge. Um, there's a natural boundary, natural road boundary, that's between where Rockledge Elementary School currently is and the town of Occoquan area. And all of that traffic that we're going to be moving to Rockledge is going to have to come out under the curve in Old Bridge. And that just doesn't make sense to me. I'm very concerned about that. There's a reason why it's going to Occoquan. And one of the questions, you don't have to answer it now because I have something else I want to mention later too. One of the questions is if we... When we build the replacement Occoquan Elementary School, will we have the capacity for all of those students that we are moving out of that particular Occoquan town area, will we have the capacity for them to stay there? Um, and then also looking at, um, looking at Westridge, that small area of the HOA that they're asking to stay in there, we're moving a lot of other areas and some that are much, much newer into Westridge Elementary School but not keeping that HOA section in. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me either, and especially when you look at, I think it was map 3A, where you have an area that's way south that's moved in. That map just didn't jive with me. I, I don't like it. Um, Occoquan Elementary School, again, back to that one. I know why we delayed the newer elementary school for Occoquan Elementary, because of the money that's put, been put into the school for renovations over the years. There is a proposal with the new CIP to possibly move it up three years, and so that's something that I think we need to have that conversation now. When are we building the new Occoquan Elementary School? Because I think that's, it, that's something we have to address with this boundary. Um, because if we're going to build it sooner rather than later, then that would be something we'd take off the table. And so that's something to consider too. Um, Vaughn Elementary School. Looking at those boundaries, it looks like the Vaughn Elementary School boundary is the same in all of them. And I will zoom in on this as much as I can. And I look at it and I'm like, it just doesn't make sense. I know it's hard with Kilby and Vaughn and Moromsko to be so close to try and get a compact boundary, but can't we do better than that? Because it's, it's, it's like a puzzle and the pieces don't fit. Um, but what I would like to propose, if the school board would be in favor of this, uh, it's unprecedented for us to have a boundary change that this, this, this big. 
we haven't done anything this big before. And in our western districts, we've had the, had the advantage of having smaller boundary changes, even though we've dealt with a lot. Um, and we haven't had to do it at one time like this. So what I would propose to the board, I think we should have a work session on this, working with our planning office, mm -hmm. where we have your, you, you go through what you were showing us with the, um, with the new maps, and we ask those questions. Okay, this is an area I have a question with. And like you were proposing us sit down one-on-one, we can do that as a board mm -hmm. and have a work session where we hash it all out and see if we can come up with something that we think works. Because like was said tonight, you know, we know we own this because it's been presented to us now and we will be voting on this. And you know, as a parent also who's gone through the boundary changes in the past, um, I know it's difficult. I know it's difficult to move your kids. I know my kids ended up, my son is my youngest especially, okay. I've told this story before, the boundary changes. My youngest, when we moved here, we thought, oh great, we'll have one child, military family, we'll have one child who's gonna go all the way through one elementary school. And then the boundaries changed. And we're like, really? Um, he ended up fine. So we know we have awesome schools. But I also know that you are all passionate about your kids. And even for everybody who's watching on television who couldn't be here tonight, who's watching on computer, we know they're passionate about their kids too. And I get it because I've been there. I advocated, I went to the meetings for my own child's boundary back in the day. We were a smaller neighborhood too. Bigger neighborhoods went out. But that's where there's some fine tuning if we can possibly do it. I'd like to see some tweaks. There are parts of each map that I like. I don't see one map I like. And that's what I'm hearing from fellow board members too. So you know, to all of you, I, to my fellow board members, I propose to you a work session. We could do it following our CIP work session next Wednesday. Or if we're going to delay it, we could do it the last Wednesday night in January. Um, I am hesitant to delay the process too far because we are getting into budget and budget is busy enough but I think it would be important for us to have those conversations and have that special focus on this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, I think were you what? next? I'll go, to, I'll go to Gil Trenum, then Dr. Waltz, and then. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Jesse, thank you for uh, uh, the kind words that back in 20, 2011, actually, I guess we did it in 2010, we. We did the boundary processes for the Linton Hall Quarter Schools, and that involved a total of one, two, three, four, five, eight different schools in my district at one point, and it was painful. Um, but, but we got through it. Uh, I, I do have one question for, uh, for Mr. Cartledge as far that I'll get to later, but first off, I want to uh, address the, the, the parents and the community members as far as, as a board, we, we do hear you. Um, Boundary processes are never fun. Uh, I've done a number of them, and they are always painful. Um, as Mr. Carlage said, you know, we, when, a, when the boundary committee uh, gives us a recommendation, we have three options we can do with that. We can accept one of the recommendations that, as, it's, as it's presented. We can um, uh, t take one or two of them and modify them, or we can reject them all and send them back. Um, I've never seen us do that as a board. Uh, the Boundary Committee, and thank you for the Boundary Committee that all the time, because the Boundary Committee members have put in a ton of time and effort on this, and they're trying to, to optimize uh, this problem as well. Um, uh, I've never seen us just send it every, everything back because the Boundary Committee has done a lot of work already, and for us to, to completely throw away all that work is, is not necessarily the best, the best option. Um, I would suggest if we, if as we have board decide we want to take these and modify them a little, that we make sure that we get those out to the community uh, for feedback before we bring them back to the board. Um, I think that would be important. <laughs> the other thing I want to tell you as community members is, like I said, we we do hear you and we do try our best. Um, I tell everybody, you know what? Tell us what you want and make your case, make your best case possible. Um, but also understand that we're not going, at some point we have to make a decision and we aren't going to make, be able to make everybody happy. No. So um, it's unfortunate, but, but we do have to make a decision at, at some point in time. Um, I do like the idea of a, of a work session if the other board members agree to that. Um, uh, I think that's 
I, I think that would be maybe I think that would be helpful in this process. Um, Mr. Carly, I do have one question it's regarding the the plan. I guess 3A that went out right before the right before the spring break or stuff like that. What was the community notification process for those? Did we do anything anything differently or? Uh, I know, we, I know we posted it to the website, but was there any communication to the school as far as saying, hey, there's, there's another plan out there? Dr. Waltz. We'll go to Dr. Waltz. Uh, Dr. Cartledge, before you answer that, will you just please review again the four classrooms that were affected and that was the trigger of one change of 79 students? Just walk through that again. Certainly, so before the break, and I'll even back up a few days before that. So we had our second community meeting and following regulation 264-2, it says that the committee will again meet, review the feedback heard, deliberate and make modifications as it sees fit. Therefore, plans three and 3A came out and were released to the public and available on the portal before any discussion of the 79 seats at Occoquan came to be. Those are two separate and distinct public releases. Speaking to Occoquan specifically, it was brought to our attention that the classrooms associated with an addition at Occoquan Elementary in 2003, the floor plans that were provided to planning by the architect had mistakenly or erroneously written the incorrect square footage on these classrooms. Our general rule of thumb that if a classroom is at least 600 square feet, we deem it as suitable for general instruction to take place. In learning of that development, we updated the program capacity of Occoquan by 79 seats. Taking what the committee had already created based on the input that it had received from emails, phone calls, chance interactions, speaking at the boundary, community meetings, emails to ourselves, emails to the board that were forwarded to us, we combined what the committee had created. There was not a new plan. We were trying in the last hours to make sure that this was still presented to the board on January 2nd as originally scheduled. We contacted the four boundary committee members who were representing the schools affected by this one new development. We said, this is the situation, what is your take? Each of the committee members said, we are in support of keeping more of Occoquan's current students at Occoquan. And that's how we came to be. So, so since this came out after Plan 3A, we actually updated 3A. We updated, I, we updated 2A, 3, and 3A. I think, uh, and just from, I think from a perception, perspective. I think that cost us some trust with the community because it felt like that we were changing things on the plans without involving them. I don't think there was any ill intent. And like, I, I agree with you that you were trying to follow the, the intent of the, of the community. I think in this case, maybe a, a, a 3B or something like that, that would have illustrated those differences might have been more appropriate. So that I think we can take as a, as a learning process going forward. Like I said, I don't think there was any ill intent. I just think the perception came across um, uh, not the not the not the best and not the most helpful in that in that instance. So um, I don't want to keep rattling on on this, but uh, like I said, there's there's a lot of work to go. And like I said, I, I think we definitely need to look at. Oh, I do want to point, I address a couple of things. I almost forgot. Regarding the grandfathering of rising fifth graders, obviously it's a recommendation that comes with, with every committee. I can't commit the board to any decisions on that, but I will say in every elementary boundary committee we've ever done, we've always grandfathered rising fifth graders to, to my right. recollection. So from that perspective. And we can look at other creative things as far as grandfathering and things like that with providing transportation. That's something we can discuss as a board because we have done those on certain instances as well. But I just wanted to uh, put that out there to kind of give some more context on things. Dr. Waltz, I, I just, uh, again, Dr. Cartledge, if you could mention as soon as it came to your attention, you brought it to the staff, you brought it to my attention, would you please explain what then was posted to 
the web where people go who are following this? Absolutely. After it was brought to our attention, we worked with senior administration to try to navigate these uncharted waters. Something like this in my tenure with the division has not happened, and we were making every effort to be transparent and timely with the process. We worked with community relations to draft a web story that was posted to the four schools affected by this development. Subsequently, there was an update posted on the boundary planning portal that shared the same information, explaining the new development, how this has affected the three plans under consideration. And in each of the three plans, Occoquan's attendance area was the same. It was the combination or the combining of what was present in plan 2A with that of 3 and 3A. I understand, I get what, I get, I get the, what happened, and I understand that, like I said, I don't think there was any ill intent what I'm trying to point out is that I think our execution created some trust issues. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's just what I would take as a learning step going forward. Okay, sure. Let me go to Willie Deutsch and then Williams and then um, Jesse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, boundary processes are always fun. Uh, we've, I guess it's this time of year again because every year on the board uh, we've had another boundary and they've all been this is very large, but they've all been fairly sizable and involved quite a few schools. Mm -hmm. um, can we go, go back to, to the beginning again? Um, how many trailers did you say we're working on eliminating? We're striving to eliminate 61 portable classrooms. And how many trailers do we have in the school division right now? 207. Okay, so we're looking at a little under a third of one trailers three. that we have in the school division we're possibly eliminating with this map. With smart boundaries, we can eliminate almost one in three. Okay, and then just so, just so I understand, how far over capacity at a school requires a trailer? Because we've got the 15% deviation mm -hmm. from the 93% average, but how far above, say 100%, do we start kicking in trailers? It's difficult to give a rule of thumb because with program capacity, the number of students that can be in each classroom fluctuates based on how many special ed, ESOL, <laughs> those pre-K programs, a variety of, of matters contribute to pro program capacity, as well as whether or not they qualify for the Virginia K-3 class size reduction grant. It could also depend on how correct. the specific- well, we, We've built program capacity into the numbers we're looking at, correct? I'm sorry? The program capacity is built into the numbers we're looking at, right? Correct, yes. Okay, so we've built in program capacity into our current projections. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how far over 100% program capacity do we start using trailers? It's based on each school's request. It depends. There's really not a hard and fast rule that says so we'll reach how do we know 70%. That? May I? Sure. Dr. So let me give you an example of something that doesn't fit neatly into what you're asking. I understand the point that you're asking, but let's say, for example, every year we try to identify and try to expand the number of gifted centers in the elementary schools so that elementary students don't have to be bused to get their gifted services. So it might be as some, something as simple as we have the funding to have a gifted facilitator in another elementary school, but there's no classroom space. So that, that doesn't fit with the numbers of actual students going there, but that's a program need that may generate a trailer. That's one example. Okay. Um, all right, we can talk more there. A um, couple of questions on the maps. 2A, there's this funny green island off of Old Bridge Elementary <coughs> School right in the middle of the Prince William Parkway boundary. Why does, why does that exist? It's a commercial center. It's a function of the way the planning zone is crafted. Oh, but there aren't any kids in that green spot? It's all connected to a spot that most likely does have residential uh, component to it. Okay. And then we have the really big island in plan three from Penn over to Westridge. Um, what, um, what, what's the point where an island that big is acceptable? In Regulation 264-2, there is no mentioning in the criteria to compactness, islands, peninsulas, or any other geographic features. 
what is working in plan three is the committee's decision to incorporate public input and allow for Reed's Prospect, Mays Quarter, Coventry Glen, and Hickory Knolls to remain at Penn Elementary. In an effort to balance enrollment, and this also speaks to the demographic composition, there was an opportunity to look at the residences on the east side of Ridgefield to then be reassigned to West Ridge to balance enrollment, enhance diversity. And the transportation is roughly a five minute drive. I, I, can, can we have order here? A five minute drive. All right. Um, and I in fact did drive that at eight o'clock on a weekday. I, the elementary schools do start after eight. Sure. I, I, I drive all every of single day to work and back from work along Old Bridge Road. Um, can you share with, um, we, we've had a lot of ideas about moving a little sliver here, a little sliver there, and uh, obviously all of those end up compounding into large changes. Um, but can you share with the board the um, numbers behind the different planning zones so that we can at least understand those as we look at those um, changes? The projected numbers per planning zone? Yes, yeah. those are already available on the portal. By each planning zone? By each planning zone. That's just a P stuff. Under okay. supporting maps. Under the P things. Okay. So we can so we can walk through those. Awesome. And then um, I think we've already had uh, requests for a uh, for a work session where we can kind of go in and fine tooth um, comb all this, but uh, and hopefully because I think at the end goal I think there are changes that are desired, um, but I think we still have to achieve the overall goal of eliminating the trailers that uh, these maps um, plan to do. And so we can see what, what changes are possible. Um, policy 132 allows for special meetings um, upon request of two or more board members. And I think multiple board members have requested at this point, but I would just like to point it out and request um, that we have it right after the next Wednesday work session um, we're all going to be here. Staff's going to be here. Um, we can we can work through some of these details. Um, and uh, it's it's a work session we've had well in advance. Um, I I I'm, I, I, th I think having the work session at the uh, we we have to have discussion before the upcoming um, board meeting where we're voting on this. Um, and I think that that work session is the opportunity to, uh, to go ahead and do that. Uh, so I would I would like to follow up on a request for a for a work session then. Uh, we've Williams. got we we have we have numerous um, agenda items coming up through the rest of the spring with the budget, CIP, school naming for this, and oh high school boundaries. There's going to be boundaries. more fun. Um, and so we we have a very tight schedule. We're going to have to keep moving through through the spring. Um, and so I would like to uh, reiterate the request for a work session after the CIP work session. Ms. Williams. Um, it, <laughs> I'm happy to participate in a work session. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deutsch, for stating that it was well publicly planned. This is, would be a new work session that was not previously scheduled. I will not be able to attend uh, next week's uh, work session, so I would like course you don't have to but considering the other half of this boundary changes in my district I'd like to be able to participate um, but you're more than welcome to hold it without me um, if you could hold it on another day that would be fantastic um, I think the work session is a great idea but what I really want to know is work sessions are fun but this has really been a matter of something of discussion for several years Miss Jessie asked for like three years if not more to have Occoquan rebuilt I have been asking for several years to have an elementary school placed in my district to alleviate overcrowding not only has this been um, a major issue and concern, but I'm actually on a joint task force for this for, um, because I care about it so much that like we talk about it there. So I'm glad that the rest of the board is like on board now, but I think that there are budgetary changes that we could make um, in moving these two uh, proposed elementary schools up that would uh, greatly factor into this boundary because what I don't wanna see happen is we make all of these boundary changes her elementary school gets built, it redistricts, uh, reboundaries, 
my schools for the third time in six years. Um, my uh, new elementary school come online in my district and you're re reboundering my kids again for the umpteenth time in six. I mean, like I've sat on this board for six years and almost sing, uh, almost every single year, somebody in my district is getting reboundaried for something it feels like. Now I'm not accurate. It's probably not every single year, but it, it really feels like it. And once again, I said this before, I know I speak English, but it doesn't seem to make a difference until somebody else on this board says the same exact thing that I say, but these are little kids. This is not a high school boundary. This is not a middle school boundary. This is the very beginning of your educational career, your community, your family, everything. This is the only time in, in your educational career where everything is awesome and amazing and you make friends and you have teachers and you feel love and it's a whole completely different experience which I know as going through it myself and because I have a 17 year old who's getting ready to graduate from high school and because I have a kindergartner who is feeling that joy right now. So I cannot stress to you enough, work session or not, we have been asking, at least I have been asking for several years not to continue to go through this in my district. And I'm still sitting right back here. And I, and I so appreciate my fellow board members for wanting to jump on board now and have a work session that's fantastic. I hope that I'm invited to come to the work session that's gonna affect my district. Um, I know that we're on a tight schedule, but I think it's the least that the rest of the board can do. But it's really critical. I mean, it, in the Western, how many times are you, are you going to reboundary one of your elementary schools? Because for me, it's Featherstone, Belmont, um, Leesylvania, Potomac View. We're, we're going through it continuously. We did when it, a community I... that most of them English is not their first language. We don't have a paper that brought that brings us together. We didn't even get afforded a community meeting. Again, with the public transportation. Again, with having to go knock on doors and let people know that don't know. It's a big deal. A work session is needed, absolutely. If you don't understand what's going on, we should do that. We should also do something about it in the budget. And that'll make a difference. But that's my question. So if we build Occoquan Elementary School and we move it up in the budget and we build my elementary school in my district that is sorely needed, am I gonna be sitting right back here again with the same kids who are still in elementary school and they're gonna be moved again? Because that's what I'd like to not see happen. I love Occoquan. I love the Lake Ridge community. It's fantastic. Spent my childhood there. But you're talking about schools who are going to go through this now, and a bunch of them aren't going to see another boundary for a long time. Why can't we think outside of the box, which I've been saying repeatedly, plan for long term, not continuously move these kids repeatedly when it's not necessary? We know the community said they're okay, and cl clearly we've been okay as a board allowing these schools to be overcrowded. If it's another year or two and it keeps the community together and these, these little kids don't have to move, and we know we're gonna approve an elementary school down the road, why are we doing this? What purpose does it serve? Whether I'm on this board or not in the next year, I'm not going away. I'm still gonna make noise whether it's on this side of the dais or that side of the dais for my kid. For my nieces and nephews, for my godchildren, and for all the other people who I tell you again don't even have a bus stop to get here or aren't coming in color t-shirts, it's a big deal. So please give my district the same respect that you're gonna give every other district when they show up with their color t-shirts and their support because everybody can rock the same way and my district can't. So I'd ask the board if you're gonna hold a work session, please allow me to be there. And when you do it, please think about how many times you're gonna move these little kids. So you talk about mental health, you're talking about some of, some of the kids who don't have food to eat, completely dependent on going to school to eat. Some of them, I see them in the stores when I go to stores who are speaking English for their parents and coming from places where you don't challenge authority. So keep that in mind, just in case I'm not there at that work session. Keep in mind how many times you're moving my kids and keep in mind we have an opportunity to do great things together and to make sense and plan for the future. And I hope that we can put aside our differences and our comments and how we feel and look at this from the perspective of six, seven, eight, nine, 10, and 11 year old kids, their families that may not have cars and who don't come and talk. Ms. Jessie. Uh, I, I guess I feel the same way she does, but for a different reason. Uh, I don't know when the adjustment 
was made for Aquan. I'm just glad that somebody admitted that there was a difference. Because I tell you what, I've been beaten up so many times about, you have 156% over capacity. Why don't you want those kids? And I, I couldn't understand it. I think I said to Ms. Dr. Cartwright, I think it was you, I said, I don't understand how this capacity thing worked. About a, maybe about a month ago, I said, I, I really don't understand how Occoquan is at 156, but I only see three or four or five trailers there. I, I don't understand how it has capacity above Potomac View and Maromsco Hills when there are 14 trailers there. I just didn't understand how the whole formula worked, and I've been begging for people to co consider Aquaquan, these kids, and then the other thing is that, which I, is important to me, because all of my life, I've worked with kids who struggle. I've worked with special ed most of my life. I've worked with low-income kids, people without T-shirts, I guess we call them, all of my life. And so Lake Ridge is different for me. But I, I don't care about the income. I don't care if you're middle class or not. You have kids. And my job is to work with every kid, whether or not I can't beat up on you because you happen to be middle class and have t-shirts. The Jessies probably would buy t-shirts too if it was about their kids. So uh, I, I think that everybody's talking about time. Everybody's concerned about something about budget time. I'm not. I think we need to do what we need to do. We've heard these people tonight. You've heard from board members tonight saying we really need to stop and relook at this. And I don't know. We can't make a recommendation tonight, apparently, but someone, either Dr. Walt's office or the planning office, or someone needs to come up with a time for us to do this and give these parents the right to make a decision. And I just want to thank um, Mr. Mallard because he was the first person to say, I think a feasibility study is feasible. It just didn't make sense to me that we've got all this land behind Occoquan, and we're talking about waiting until 2028, and we've got kids in Vaughn and Gay Polar will tell you, we were a high-performing school. We were, we were off the hook. And Aquaquan is off the hook. So when she talk about those kids in Aquaquan, they are nationally ranked. So those parents, I don't care what their income is, they don't want their kids to leave Aquaquan. I wouldn't. We should be sending people to Aquaquan. Instead, we're talking about moving all these kids all around. So I, I, I guess we've both all been on our soap operas, but this has been... Um, I know people have met and looked at numbers and said, well, Lily, you know, we don't want to have a meeting. We don't want to have this. We don't have, you know, uh, I'll tell you, my husband, who is an Occoquan resident, who is so left brain that I think he could organize all the spices in the house, has been looking at these plans for three, I don't know, for the last week. Every time I go in, he's looking at how can we make this better? I do have one question for you. Um, Oakwood, right across from Obridge, why was that community not, did not go to Antietam? Why was that not considered? All you have to do is come out and make a right. I think the simple answer is that there were a variety of configurations considered by the committee that did not ultimately become a formal plan. As each of these criteria were looked at, that never came to be an actual plan that the committee wanted to move forward with. I, w I would like for you to, to look at that because the reason being that if Oakwood, and I don't want to speak for Oakwood to just, but I, I would like for us to look at all the possibilities because that would create um, a better situation for Old Bridge. And when Dr. Waltz talks about trailers, there's no way. I think Old Bridge is at 140. She only has one trailer. It, these, how she uses that space, I don't know. 
but the trailers, the, somehow the trailer and capacity somehow don't quite mix. Sometimes it has to do with special ed, I know, and whatever. So, But anyway, I'm done. I just want you guys to reconsider, give it the time that it needs, and we can adjust and do whatever we need to do, but we need to do the right thing by parents. Mr. Wilk. I'm, my question's probably are out of context, but I'm gonna ask them still, because it's important stuff I wanna know about the community engagement piece. Uh, when it came to the community forums or the meetings held by the committee and the group, how many were done officially from your guy's end, Dr. Cartledge? There were two. There were two? Yes. Okay, that's typical, okay. Two were held. How were community members notified? So each parent or guardian received an email in the language spoken at home, telling them of the community meeting, the opportunity to come and learn about the boundary process, and our boundary portal was also linked in it. At each meeting, we provided handouts that showed the plans, the configurations. We had interpreters at each meeting to try to enable all those to be active in the process. Were there any notifications? I mean, is it typical that HOAs or any specific groups or community organizations are notified on top of just the parents in the school system as well, or is there any outreach done in that level? Historically, no. We do not have a database that contains all the contact information for the various HOAs. Do principals have the discretion to hold their own meetings within their buildings about this? The principals, the school staff, have been encouraged to remain positive and open to the boundary process. There were never any efforts to silence them. If they were community members, they were welcome to come to the community meetings and provide their input. Okay. And there's nothing really prohibiting school board members from having their own town halls in these events? No. Okay, thank you, I just need yeah, those. Absolutely. Okay, um, so I guess it's my turn. Um, so you know, as uh, we live in a, it's a challenging place and a challenging time, um, this is a growing community. We have the highest and most crowded classrooms in the Northern Virginia area. We will, whether we want to or not, continue to build schools. Um, and every time we build a school or add an addition, there's going to be boundary changes. And unfortunately, that's the, the, um, the lot we have here in Prince William County. Where I grew up, they never changed a boundary once. I mean, people left our town, you know, that's from Youngstown, Ohio. And, um, and so it, you never had a boundary meeting. There was no such thing. Everybody was just in the same school their whole life. But uh, even my, where I live, my boundaries have changed a couple of times already, and, um, and, and so it is a challenge. Um, there are a number of things that the citizens brought up tonight that match the number of email traffic I get. I try to answer all the emails and, and get messages back to everyone. I, I want everyone to know in the community that I read every single one of them. I look at every map someone sends me, and I hear every story. Um, that someone sends me. And so I've looked at all of them and made sure staff has seen them as well. Um, and that I certainly will continue to commit to you to do that. Um, the board here, from what I gather, sounds like they would like to have another work session. I don't think that is unreasonable. We have a deadline in the sense that we are proposing, proposing our budget in the first meeting in February. So we'd like to have these boundary lines done before then, partly because um, that determines what each school gets money-wise because it's the numbers base. And it'll also determine what teachers get to hire. So if we do a work session, um, Ms. Williams can't come next Wednesday. Anyways, if we did it at the same time we do the CIP, I'm, and I'm throwing this out there for the board to think about, that's just gonna be an, another long meeting like tonight. And I think these longer the meetings get, the less effective and productive they are for everybody involved. A meeting that we do that's a work session is a public meeting, so the public is invited and, and involved. Um, I think there's a number of things here that, as I talked to the superintendent, Dr. Cartledge, earlier today, I had my own meeting with him regarding these things, that there are some things that, based on what the community has come out to talk about, can be addressed in a, quote, new plan or a modified plan that we have here. 
Um, and, and I think the staff has reassured me and they're working daily to try to accommodate everything we can. We're not gonna be able to do that as you heard from Gil Trenum who's the most senior member of this board and, and has been around a long time and been through many more of these than I have. Um, and, I, and I can't promise you it, you're all gonna be happy with me and you certainly can not vote for me in the fall. Um, that is totally you're you know, entitled to. We are doing everything we can and I can tell you that you know, the process that the committee, the, the committee spent a lot of time, they worked on this, they looked at a lot of these things. Um, you know, we get a lot more emails and I get a lot more emails and a lot more complaints about trailers. I get a lot more emails about overcrowded classrooms and how that affects the way children learn. This process is a way to help address that. Um, so I'm gonna ask that, um, Mary, how, how do we go about setting up a work session meeting? or a meeting to, so for example, if we, if my thoughts are, and I'm just speaking out loud here, that we will work to modify some of the things that have been brought up today. I suspect that the board members will sit down with Dr. Cartledge to address their concerns and with Dr. Waltz. Over the next couple of days, we may come up with a couple modifications to the plan that we can start working on or look at next Thursday, because I'd like to have Ms. Williams here. And I just don't want to sit through another long meeting like this um, next Wednesday. And if we can get something done next Thursday, then we have time to vote on it and, and approve it in time for the budget, which would keep the staff and the superintendent happy. And Mr. Beavers, as I look at him. Um, Ms. Mary, how, how do we go about doing this? I haven't had to do one of these. Uh, did you want to talk? Oh, no, I, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I, I was at, well. Either one, superintendent given, or Mary can given, tell me. Given the time constraints, I think the most effective thing would be for the board to agree tonight uh, by consensus on a, yeah. on a meeting date. Okay. So I would, I would ask that we consider January 10th, which is Thursday evening, um, say 6 o'clock, our normal time, um, to do a work session on this boundary. It would be a public meeting. 6.30. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 6.30. 6.30. And, and as long as there's no objection, I think we can set up a meeting for that. Uh, meaning we all have a lot of work to do over the next couple of days. I expect the board members who have concerns to sit with Dr. Waltz, with Ms. Dr. Cartledge, and go through the concerns they have and see what we can do to address what the public is demanding of us. Realizing we can't address every single request and I can tell you that we've gone through stacks of emails. And there are reasons why some of these plans were modified before the holiday, because some of those had a lot of emails. And, and so we, we worked hard on that. And I, I do want to commend Dr. Cartledge, the committee who put the time in. Um, you know, there are some counties that don't even have these committees. The board just draws a line, and that's it. You live with it, and that's what you get. We are trying to have a, trying to have a transparent system Transparent system requires then we have, you know, these kinds of emotional meetings, which, um, you know, um, is part of the process. So, again, um, I can commit to you that we will work really hard to address these issues. Um, and I think we have set up a meeting for Thursday, Mary? No objections? Okay. So we'll move on. It would appear that... That's yep. correct. You're stating it. That the motion that the that, that clerk, uh, Debbie, we're going to set up a meeting for next Thursday. There's no opposition to having a meeting for next Thursday for a work session. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to see if so I can find a space to meet. Yeah, we, well, we can use this spot right here. Well, it's probably booked. <laughs> okay. Well, we, we can. We'll figure it out. That's what kind of chairman am I if I can't even get my own room? <laughs> what will the voters think then? All right. Um, so I think um, I will wrap up this discussion and thank all the citizens who came out tonight. And thank you. I understand this is very important, and we will try to do our very best to do right by, you know, whatever we can. But realize the whole purpose of this is to address the highest overcrowded, most overcrowded classrooms in Northern Virginia. And that's the reality. You're living in the shadow of the world's capital. It will continue to grow. There will be new schools every single year. Our CIP meeting, which will be Wednesday, if you'd like to come to that, that's very exciting. Um, we'll address that. So thank you all very much. We will move on to whatever's next.
math textbooks, far more exciting. Eighteen oh one, mathematics textbook adoption. Rita Goss. Please get together with Cartridge and Dr. Moore. I've already sent them the, the same things I've sent. I've sent them. And when I tell you, I sent my initial email. Chairman Latif, uh, members of the board, Dr. Waltz. Is there anyone? Um, Ken Bassett filling in for Ms. Goss this evening. Um, I'm pleased to present for information this evening the recommendations of the Mathematics Textbook Adoption Committee. I'd like to invite Ms. Amy Hickey, Supervisor of Mathematics, to share with you the work of the committee and their recommendations for your consideration at this time. Good evening, Chairman Latif. Dr. Waltz, and school board members. It is with great pleasure that I'm here tonight to um, present to you the Mathematics Textbook Committee's recommendations for kindergarten through calculus uh, textbooks. I have to say I took great pride in working and watching this 57-member team come together to discuss across all grade levels the student needs and the teacher needs and as they developed a mutual understanding of the criteria for which they will be using. Uh, they then moved um, and each member then applied their expertise and time to understanding the demands of the new Virginia standards of learning and then spent um, this expertise really studying the intricacies of each of the products they reviewed. So let's begin. It was great to collaborate with our um, career and technology education team um, as we implemented this uh, regulation that guides this process. Um, our timelines and our, here we go, our timelines and our criteria uh, was jointly submitted to the school board um, and approved in February. March through May, we worked with the Office of Communi Community Relations to um, notify all stakeholders of our application process for forming our um, committees. Uh, in addition, we also wanted to notify the public as to the three locations of which our uh, textbooks would be on display for public review and public comment. Um, after we uh, formed our committees, um, we, the team uh, kicked off their meeting on May 21st, and then from there worked diligently through the, in, through the entire summer and through October and developing and reviewing uh, the textbooks and developing their recommendations for which I begin this presentation. So here you just see a summary of the courses that we, um, uh, that each of the members considered um, as they reviewed textbooks. You'll see um, Advanced Placement Cambridge and International Baccalaureate um, because these courses also, um, th each of these programs also have versions of these courses that go along with it. So this is just sort of a summary of all of them pulled together. Let's begin with our elementary. So with our elementary, uh, the committee is recommending the series Stepping Stones 2.0 Origo Education. Uh, the series provides students with the learning experience promoted in the Virginia Standards of Learning for developing enduring conceptual understanding, problem solving skills, and opportunities for ample practice to reach the desired level of procedural fluency. It incorporates the strategies that promote language and discourse multiple models and space practice learning. All these strategies have shown to have high impact on student achievement and the visible learning research led by Dr. John Hattie. Moving to our middle school courses. Um, our, our grades uh, six through grade eight courses. Um, we had a subcommittee of those. 
each broken down by also math six, grade six, I should say grade seven and uh, grade eight. Um, they followed the same process that the elementary did in the sense that they first did their um, reviews at their individual grade levels where they applied the standards, the criteria and the standards that applied to them. But then they came together um, to discuss six through eight, both the strengths and weaknesses of all the textbooks under review. And as a group, they came and recommended, each one felt that Big Ideas Math uh, Virginia Edition was a recommend, recommendation to go forward for these five courses. Uh, again, this, uh, this series does um, provide a nice balance between that developing of conceptual understanding and, and uh, procedural uh, fluency as well. Our Algebra 1 Geometry and Algebra 2 series, again, they worked as a group as well. First, looking at Algebra 1, uh, a group looked at Geometry and a group looked at Algebra 2. And after each review of each textbook, they came together as a team. And interestingly enough, this review and the discussions that they had was independent of what the middle school did. So they came to the same conclusion, independent of middle school, um, of big ideas, um, uh, series as well for Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2. They um, cited the same attributes as, they, um, as our middle school did. Uh, in fact, one of our teachers said, you know, this textbook is really written for the students. And I thought that was really um, a profound statement from there. Uh, they felt it had the strong alignment, student-friendly, and provided strong teacher resources to support all our learners. Okay, so that ends the um, ones that are associated with the rec um, for which the VDOE provides um, uh, review of textbooks. And now we move into our territory of looking at our um, elective courses. The three you see here are, uh, we're starting with is our uh, semester courses, uh, probability and statistics, trig, and discrete mathematics, and the, rec the books that are recommended for them. Now we're moving into our elective courses that are year long, um, starting with advanced computer math, advanced mathematics, and our two pre-calculus courses. Now this is where we begin our um, programs such as our advanced placement programs. And you'll see that we have the Algebra 1 and Geometry and Pre-AP Algebra 2 trig for our pre-AP courses. And they will also be using the, the recommendation is also for the Big Ideas uh, math series for there. This is now showing the five AP courses that we offer through the mathematics um, uh, program. Both of our calculus courses, our statistics, and our two computer science courses now. Our Cambridge courses are listed here. Again, you're seeing the geometry and the algebra two. Uh, both of those are the International General Certificate of Secondary Education courses um, offered through Cambridge. And then commonly referred to in our uh, as IGSI, and then our ACE, which is our Advanced International Certificate of Education courses, are listed here as well. And finally, our International Baccalaureate courses. Again, our Algebra 1 Geometry and Algebra 2 Trig. Our IB Computer Science Standard Level and High Level courses. And then our um, IB uh, math analysis and approaches um, courses for both our standard level and our high level. This is a two year sequence, so that's where you see the one and two for each of those. So at this time, I don't know if anyone's left, but at this time I would like to um, thank our textbook committee members. Is there anyone out there? Oh, they're still here. A few of all, let's give them a hand. <laughs> and 
Yes, as well as our, um, as, as well as the student learning math staff as well. Um, I just have to say, I'm just so proud to be a part of this team. Um, I would like to say thank you to both those that are here and those that are at home and their incredible dedication throughout the summer and the start of the school year. Their professional expertise was just amazing as they um, used and applied the criteria and the hours spent reviewing not only the textbook, but they also had the opportunity to re um, review the digital resources as well. I was so impressed with their discussions and the attention to detail this math committee did. I could hear all that training for our English learners coming through in those discussions and the needs uh, for all our students um, in there as well. So I want to thank them. Our parents, our, city, our citizens, Office of Instructional Technology and Purchasing, Office of Student Learning, administrators, librarians, supply services, services and co custodians, and most of all, we'd like to also thank uh, the school board for considering our recommendations. Thank you very much. Any questions, discussion? Well, listen, I have to tell you that I, I'm thrilled by these recommendations. I did look at the books, and the, I'm a big fan of the Big Ideas book. And, um, Great. And I know the committee loved it. They did, clearly. This is what they recommended, and, and I'm, I'm thrilled. And, um, and so I'm excited, and I want to thank you all for putting the time and effort into this. This will be voted on at the next meeting. Correct? And any questions, folks? Any concerns, thoughts? Okay, great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank we'll you move on much. to the uh, career and technical education textbook um, adoption. Chairman Latif, members of the board, Dr. Waltz, pleased to present for information the recommendation of the career and technical education textbook adoption committee. I'd like to invite Mr. Doug Wright, supervisor of career and technical education, to share with you the work of their committee and the recommendations for your consideration. Uh, good evening, uh, Chairman Latif, board members, Dr. Waltz, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm getting a little choked up. I was so excited about this event. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you this evening, um, and Happy New Year. Very excited. Uh, this exercise in career and technical education for our textbook adoption uh, involved a lot of uh, our teachers, a lot of our stakeholders as students, uh, the special ed department, um, our EL uh, office as well. We wanted to make sure the textbooks we brought forward to students for all our CTE students address their learning styles and their learning needs. So very proud of this work and it was a great exercise. Um, our process, just like the one with math, and it was great to work with our colleagues in the math department, uh, followed a four-step process back in February. Our timeline was presented to you. Our criteria was presented and approved. We moved forward with the textbook adoption committee. We had 21 subcommittees that we needed to form because of the, the volume of books for career and technical education. Uh, we put it out to public uh, so that they would know exactly what's going on and made it available. We did have our books at three different libraries, two public libraries, one on the eastern end of the county, one on the western end, and then one right here at the Kelly Leadership Center in our professional library. And we're here tonight to present those findings to you, our recommendations. Just a reminder to the board that in career and technical education, we have eight areas of study for our students. At the middle school of those eight, we have four represented, business and information technology, family and consumer science, technology education, and careers. Those four are in the middle school, and we have 10 courses for students at the middle school level as part of the encore. Um, in our high school programs, all eight of those program areas are represented, and we have over 100 elective courses available at the high school level to our students in the school division. Very proud of those accomplishments. Uh, the board just approved six new courses for us this year. Uh, computer game design, one and two. Um, cybersecurity, levels one and two. And electricity, one and two. So would like to thank the board for those approvals. Jumping right into the high school textbooks um, in our architect in our agriculture and horticulture program, uh, there are four textbooks. Three you'll see here, and then on the next slide, this textbook 
for that program area. That is a specialty course that is available at Brentsville District High School, and that is the Agriculture and Horticulture program. Moving on, the next is our largest, and that's business and information technology at the high school. We have quite a few courses in that area. Um, just to make the board aware, you won't see every course because we're very fortunate in Virginia that the Virginia Department of Education provides for us resources known as the Imagine Academy. It is a free resource that is out there for our students and teachers, and it's an online resource, and it's updated annually. So it's, it's a great thing that we have here in the Commonwealth of Virginia for our students. Um, another thing to remind the board of is a number of these courses, because of the industry credential and things like that, we get updated online resources as well. So not every course will have the requirement or need for a new textbook because of the online availability. So those are those business courses. Moving right on, right along to some additional courses. And you'll notice that sometimes when we can, our teachers were very uh, fiscally minded, if you will. Uh, they could use a textbook for courses that complement one another, meaning a student would be a completer taking a course one year and then the sequence of the course the next year, they would then use that same textbook further moving along with that book. Here are some other programs that we have for CTE courses in business, economics and personal finance, entrepreneurship, principles of business and marketing. And in programming, um, just to let the board know with our programming, um, you'll notice that Visual Basic and Java were the two languages. Um, primarily the reason for that was when the committee reviewed this, we looked at business partners, what's out there in the business community for our students as far as next steps, and then for higher ed. What would they see when they move on to college and other opportunities? And that's why Visual Basic for programming and advanced programming was Java those languages. Uh, there are many others out there, but those were the ones recommended by our industry business partners and our higher ed partners. Now we'll look at our family and consumer science program. It is the second largest area we have at the high school with a number of courses, and these are the courses recommended. Moving on, culinary arts, the national ref... Restaurant Association, uh, that textbook is what we'll use for that course. Again, it is a two-year sequence, and it's using that same textbook to enhance and supplement instruction. Early childhood education, uh, levels one and two, once again, we're gonna use that same textbook to continue on for those students. Looking at some more family and consumer science courses, you can see what we have recommended for you there. And then additionally, these courses, individual development, life planning, nutrition and wellness. And now Virginia Teachers for Tomorrow, that is a program we're very proud of. Uh, that's part of that Growing Your Own program that we use here in the division. Uh, it's really exciting to get students started thinking about a career in public education. And we've had a lot of students return to us uh, through that program as Prince William County educators. Good stuff. Uh, now we move on to health and medical sciences, sports medicine, sports medicine too. A lot of programs. <laughs> uh, marketing, fashion marketing, advanced fashion, hotel management and operations. Marketing and then opportunities in hospitality and tourism. Sports, sports and entertainment, and this has been one of our big growing areas in our marketing is the sports entertainment and sports management area. Um, student enrollment has really increased there. Now we move into technology education and our engineering program, architectural drawing, engineering drawing and design, engineering and exploration. Two more courses, basic technical drawing and video media technology. 
Uh, to remind the board, Project Lead the Way is something we have embraced as a division, and it's been awesome for our students. It really has opened a whole lot of opportunities for our students. Couldn't be more proud of our students, our teachers, and the programs. You'll notice that for Project Lead the Way, there are only two books here that are uh, recommended by the committee. The reason for that is because we have nine total Project Lead the Way courses. We have five in engineering and four in biomedical. We, we participate with Project Lead the Way annually, and they provide us with online resources. So the only two courses that wanted a hardback paper book were the Civil Engineering, CEA, and Introduction to Engineering Design. And those are represented there. Um, when we move into our TNI, trade and industrial programs, here is the automotive program, and you'll see again that sequentially we're going to use the same book for levels one, two, and three. Building trades, the same thing, using the same book as a continuation. And once again, with these textbooks and a lot of things with career and technical education, there's a vocabulary and terminology that our students struggle with. One thing our committees, all subcommittees, all took a lot of time to make sure of was that vocabulary broken down, was that terminology in the book, was it explained well? And that was for all learners, our E uh, language learners and our special ed students, as well as our gifted students. So I was very proud of the work our committee did to make sure that that was present. Criminal justice, here are the textbooks proposed for that. Cybersecurity. Um, the new course the board just approved this year, levels one and two, um, here are the books recommended for that. And please be mindful that we have access to the Virginia Cyber Range and a number of online resources as well. So, you know, that keeps things current and keeps up with the pace of technology when you have those online resources. Television production, using the same textbook for those three levels of that program area. Middle school, quickly, there for our learners in the middle school, those are our three courses for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, and those are the books recommended for those students. Family and consumer science, again, grades six, seven, and eight, and those are the textbooks recommended for those learners in those courses. Career investigations, that is our seventh grade uh, opportunity for students to explore careers, uh, the book recommended for that. And then our middle school program, Technology Education, which again, that's Project Lead the Way. We infuse Project Lead the Way into the state curriculum, and we've had great success with that because it's then gotten a lot of students excited about the opportunity to move into engineering programs at high school. So once again, those are also the gateway to engineering and all those program areas have online annually updated resources. You might look at the date there and say, whoa, that's kind of out of date. Well, just so the board knows, those are annually updated online through our partnership with Project Lead the Way. So it really keeps us current. And now I'd like to thank everyone that was involved. I have a staff uh, in the CTE team, and I'd like to thank Mary Beth Dobbins. Hand Mary Beth, yay! Because honestly, to bring this group of educators, students, parents, folks from the Office of Special Ed, uh, folks from the Office of um, uh, English Learners together, it really does take a lot of coordination and someone with those great organizational skills, you gotta have that right hand. So Mary Beth and my uh, secretary who's not with us tonight, Stephanie Stannard, really did a great job. I uh, wanna thank our textbook committee members. Uh, there were approximately 60 of them. It did take a lot of time because many of them had to review multiple, multiple textbooks, as you can see from what I presented tonight. Our parents, citizens, Office of Instructional Technology, uh, the purchasing department, my boss, Office of Student Learning, been very supportive. Uh, the school-based administrators, I mean, really, that, that's a key component of all this and the success we've had in the division with career and technical education. The librarians that really made sure that those books were there. Um, we'd go check on them every once in a while, and we could see the carts had been, you know, people were looking at the books. That was a good thing. Um, supply services, are the custodians, and thank you to the board here for all your support with career and technical education and looking at our recommendations. Thank you very much.
Any questions? Ms. Jesse. <clears throat> I, I don't have questions. I, I just love what you're doing. You know, I love career education. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I've, I've just fallen in love with it. And the last time we met, uh, a friend of mine and just asked me, and I mentioned it to you guys then, I, I'd like for Dr. Waltz and his staff to think about it, and that was on slide, I think it's slide uh, 25. You have cosmetology. Yes. And they are, there are several people who ask, why do you not have barber shops, barber school, barber courses? I would really like for you to consider that because we have this for, for girls, and being a barber, I'm told, can be very lucrative. Just ask my husband. Yeah, so he, he, he says that his barber charges him huge amounts of money. <laughs> So, uh, but it is a, uh, an, an area that we, I'd like for you guys to really consider as we're upgrading our schools. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wilk, thank you. I just real quick want to say thank you for the electrical program. I know I've been hounding you guys since I got on the board about the importance of that. I think that apprenticeship and the partnership, what we're doing there, I know we weren't able to put it in Forest Park or Potomac, but it's good for kids throughout the county, and I, I'm really happy about it. I think you know, 20 years from now, it'll be something I really say was something I'm really happy about and proud of that we implemented. So thank you for your support with that. Well, thank you, and thank you for your help with that as well. Ms. Williams, Woodbridge District. <laughs> um, I just want to uh, say thank you, too. Um, uh, we, I first started to see you appear before the board. We uh, had a joke up here on the board that when we saw Mr. Wright, there could be no wrong <laughs> because you've done so much uh, for, C for the CTE program. Um, and I just want to reiterate the same thing. Thank you. I'm so grateful that we have been able to keep their original vocational programs, as they used to be called, and now they're modified and upgraded for today. And there are so many students who are taking advantage of these programs, and I'm, I'm very grateful that we are continuously expanding this and that you're still running in the lead. And thank you, Mr. Bassett, because I know that you're instrumental in making sure that not only these books go through, but you're like the language man in my book. You carry that golden ticket item of translating these <laughs> at, this material for our students to take advantage of. And um, I think you've done a wonderful job. I know this is very time intensive because it's not just a single subject. And there's a lot of students from all over who participate in these programs. Um, and I can tell you as a parent side, I've had a couple go through. Um, and it's been really refreshing to know that they can sit in a class that is comprised of maybe AP students or English second language students mm -hmm. and still be able to keep up and learn uh, the same material. And I think that that is uh, priceless. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wright, thank you. My favorite time of the meetings is textbooks. Dr. Waltz knows I love textbooks. He knows I love them. And, uh, and so uh, I'm, I'm excited, and thank you for all the hard work you guys have done. This is fantastic, and um, I'm looking forward to the students enjoying them. Ms. Hickey, thank you. Ken Bassett, thank you, sir. Ms. Goss in Abstentia. Ms. Rojas back there, who's my favorite math teacher in the county, with Mrs. McDonald. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I don't, I'm not trying. I'm not trying, Miss Jesse. <laughs> Superintendent's time. Oh, oh we have w the last agenda item. Where, what? what? That's uh, the uh, pr proposed rezoning for race oh, regard. Yeah, what, 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 that was. That's under, that's under board matters. So Dr. to go first. I'll just sit right back there. Well, well, you know what? <laughs> While I'm here. How would you like to do it, Dr. Waltz? Well, it's 1130. I doubt there's anyone watching us on TV at this point. It doesn't matter. Oh, yeah, there is. It's fine. My mom's okay. still watching. We'll, we'll do Dr. Waltz, and then, and then we'll just to here. stay to the order yes, here so I don't get yelled at by the clerk. No problem. Dr. Waltz, Superintendent. Thank you, Chairman Latif, members of the board. Happy New Year to everyone. I hope everyone had a restful holiday break and are ready for all the great opportunities waiting for us in the new year. I'm excited to share that the welding program at Potomac High School was featured in an article in a publication of the National Ornamental and Miscellaneous Metals Association. Right here, I've got the actual magazine. 
Also, a picture of our students was published on the front of this magazine, which is, again, entitled Ornamental and Miscellaneous Metal Fabricator. The article describes this specialty program at our own Potomac High School as a model program. The article shares that 20 local welding employers visited our program last spring and expressed how impressed they are with our program and our students. Congratulations to Doug Wright, Supervisor of Career and Technical Education Programs, and to teacher Simon Bagwandeen for their work to ensure our students are future ready, and for Mr. Wright's entire team, you may now be excused. <laughs> Last month, Michelle Roper, Director of Special Education, provided the school board with an update on our progress on the special education audit recommendations. One of the programs we are using that was mentioned last month is called Teach Town, which focuses exclusively on children diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, developmental and intellectual disabilities, and emotional behavioral disorders. Ms. Roper has shared with me that she has received a significant amount of positive feedback from teachers regarding Teach Town. Debbie Brown, a Montclair Elementary teacher of students with autism, thanked the school division for purchasing Teach Town. Quote, my students are so engaged and loving every bit of this awesome learning program, in quotes, she said on Twitter. I'd like to congratulate Michael, or I'm sorry, Michelle Bosham, make sure I got that right, Michael Bosham, director of bands at Hilton High School, The Vault, a national music education retailer named Mr. Bosham, one of the top 25 music teachers yep. in the United States. Congratulations again to Michael. I also want to remind everyone that online registration for spring virtual high school classes will begin January 4th and continue through the 21st of January. More information is available on our website at www.pwcs.edu. Before the winter break, I had the opportunity to visit Mary Williams Elementary School. I was invited to speak to about 100 kindergarten students on what I do as superintendent of schools. I was impressed as the students uh, skip counted by tens to 100 and other mathematical feats and asked numerous thought-provoking questions of me about my career. I also participated in Garfield High School's International Baccalaureate Diploma and Certificate Program graduation. Congratulations to all the graduates at Garfield's IB program. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Dr. Waltz. You're up, sir. We have Mr. Wayne Mallard, who's excited to be presenting at 1131. <laughs> On, I was so uh, anxious. You look at him. He, look, so look, he looks like he's, he's just, fresh. He, he's, he, look, he just walked in. So this uh, agenda item uh, has to do with the uh, proposed rezoning for raised regard. So tonight we're recommending that the uh, school board approve the development impact statement for the raised regard rezoning that states the school board is opposed to any rezoning application that causes student enrollment either division-wide by school level or by student enrollment at any affected school to exceed 100% of capacity. So I think in your packet you have the updated uh, impact statement. I'd like to recognize and thank Maureen Hannon for her hard work on uh, this impact statement. This reflects a lot of input from the board, from legal, and from staff. Um, are you guys done? Or? So I'll go to Ms. Williams first. Um, very quickly before I make the motion, I wanted to thank you for staying to 1130 at night. <laughs> um, the reason why I, I actually asked for this to be pulled off the consent agenda, um, because there's been a lot of um, confusion when those when we take a vote as a board and what our development impact statement means. Um, I wanted to publicly thank you and your team for revising and working with the county. I think you um, 
staff has done an, an excellent job of trying to communicate in the very best way possible when we don't agree with it, an upcoming proposal, even though we're voting to approve the statement of trying to explain to the public, um, again, that an approval of a statement is not necessarily an approval of the upcoming development. And I can't thank you enough for revising that language. And I thought it was important enough that we do this as a standalone vote so that we can once again reiterate um, that we may approve a development impact, state, impact statement, but that does not necessarily mean that we're in favor of, of the development. So having said that, I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the development impact statement for the raise regard rezoning that states the school board is opposed to any rezoning application that causes student enrollment, whether either division wide by school level or by student enrollment at any affected school to exceed 100% of the capacity. Do second. I have a second? A second. Ms. Jesse, second. Ms. Williams, first. Discussion? Questions, thoughts, concerns? Mr. Deutsch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to point out again that uh, this impact statement uh, represents uh, a new form of impact statements that we're going to be seeing uh, from the school board uh, after a lot of uh, discussion, improvement, et cetera. Um, uh, one of the highlights is this one should be crystal clear to everybody since it's titled Development Impact Statement and Opposition of the Prince William County School Board to Proposed Rezoning. And for the public, this is a significant change that we are clearly stating uh, opposition to certain developments that uh, are going to put our uh, student, our uh, schools over capacity due to the additional development. Um, and we're, we're being as crystal clear as I think we can be. Um, and I think one of the other uh, important things is that in this one, uh, we refer to the division-wide impact um, that we have, and there has been challenges before where there might be little pockets where mm -hmm. uh, an area might be argued to be underdeveloped, but uh, we are a full ecosystem here as a Prince William County School Division, and at the middle school and high school level, uh, we are over capacity. Uh, we're getting, we're under capacity for elementary school after a lot of work, um, but we're still over capacity there at middle and high, and making that point uh, is important as we, as we build that case, and I think um, we're going to start seeing a lot of development impact statements over the next couple of meetings. Yes. Uh, and they're going to uh, uh, continue to hopefully make that case um, that uh, overcrowding is bad for our schools. And uh, look forward to those improvements. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to uh, also comment on this because I attended the planning meeting, uh, I think it was about a week ago. And uh, the way our impact statement apparently was so... Uh, it was not as concrete and, and forceful, so the developer was able to, to tell everyone that Prince William County School Board supported uh, this rezoning. So I'm really pleased to see that we're going to get something out. Thank you very much. Please vote. Where's mine? Oh. The vote is eight yes, unanimous. Motion passed. Why is that so fast? That's not fast. Um, excellent. Um, we will now move on to um, board matters. Um, let's start down there. It's a new year. Ms. Satterwhite. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right before break, I had the pleasure of um, going to Novant Prince William Hos uh, Medical Center with a group of students from Stonewall Jackson High School's Chick-fil-A Leadership Academy. And it was an absolute joy to join them as they donated for their Do Good December project. It was called Stuffed with Love. Over 200 stuffed animals collected from students, staff, community members, and Stonewall Jackson community, and donated them for children who are in the emergency room or who are receiving treatment at um, Prince William Medical Center. And I want to thank the students who are involved. Um, the students, there were three students there presenting, excuse me, four students there presenting who were representing the Chick-fil-A Leadership Academy, Cobena Mensa, Devin Smith, Angela Montero, and Angelica Prado. And forgive me if I mispronounced your names. I also want to thank the sponsor, Ms. Jill Crane, 
Um, Ms. Diana Galata was there with us and Sam to videotape. So there was a story um, on Prince William News. I want to thank um, Alex Joseph, Liz Redemsky, and Dr. McHugh, and the folks from X-Ray, uh, head nurse from the um, emergency department for meeting with us, listening to our students. I also want to thank Mr. Jeremy Smith, who sponsors the CFA Academy on behalf of Chick-fil-A. Um, the cow was there. We had a great time. Um, students were able to discuss their project with hospital staff and able to get a tour. And what was really fascinating is after they had the tour, um, I had hung around and was doing some other things at the hospital. And after the tour, I saw them at the end, and they all asked for volunteer applications. And that was exciting. And so. Um, it's, it's great to see our students not only giving back, but then continuing to give back as they are more invested in our community and volunteering. I loved it. So I want to thank everybody involved. The Chick-fil-A Leadership Academy at Stonewall Jackson High School is doing a lot of great things. This is, the, I believe, the second year of the program. Um, thank you to them also for the invitation. It was great to be with them. And Happy New Year to everybody. In light of the time, I'll pass. Ms. Ralston. I pass. Mr. Wilk. Quick recognition before break. I had the pleasure of attending the Forest Park Choral Concert. Great concert. Ashland Springs, con Spring Strings. I'm tired. Sorry, Springs. Ashland Strings Concerts. Uh, attended one at Potomac High School. I think they're division leading, um, conference leading at least, uh, high school basketball game uh, with uh, my pre uh, uh, Miss Betty Covington with me. And then I also had a chance to visit Montclair and Patty Elementary uh, on the last day break. So I want to recognize all those schools for having me and great events. Thank you. Ms. Williams. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to apologize for missing the last meeting. I had the special pleasure of being on a Santa train the week before with a lot of children under the age of five who shared a lot more than their love with me. Um, so that was why I was not here. I tried to make every meeting as, uh, to the best of my ability. Um, I also wanted to uh, take this time because uh, in the past, normally, when we do our organizational meeting, we take a minute and uh, cheer for whoever is uh, selected as vice chair. So I'd like to take this time to, to congratulate Mr. Wilk on being our next vice chair. Um, I wish you all the best of luck with that. I think you'll, you'll do a good job. And uh, sorry about that. Um, I don't know why we didn't clap, but I'm all for clapping, so. Um, yeah, usually we do. Um, and then I just wanted to reiterate again, um, you know, I do appreciate the planning committee and the staff and everyone who puts the time and the effort into these boundary changes and all these meetings. It's not difficult. I mean, excuse me, it is especially difficult, and uh, I really respect the effort that goes into that. Um, I'm really hoping that we are able to come together as a board and um, make this as equitable and uh, as fair as we possibly can. I recognize that we definitely are never going to make everybody happy, uh, but I think that, like I said earlier, this is, again, a once, uh, an opportunity for us as a board to really think outside the box and do a whole lot of good for a lot of young students, and um, I hope that we can achieve that together. Um, and uh, Happy New Year to everyone. <coughs> Jesse. Uh, I think there's a slide in the back uh, earlier this evening. Uh, we recognize uh, Irene Cromer and for the work that she has done in Prince William County Schools, but for her work for Martin Luther King Youth Oratorical, which is uh, getting close to 30 years and uh, will be nas is nationally recognized and will apparently be a part of a television uh, opportunity. I just want to thank Irene for all that she's done and uh, for not just for MLK, but I mentioned earlier that she was instrumental in the naming of Fanny Fitzgerald School because she did all the research and brought that, that uh, particular event into uh, the eyes of, of the public. Also wanted to make an announcement uh, that I'm required to let everyone know that I'm placing on the placing uh, on the board and the public in the public on notice that I intend to move and to amend a policy 115 compensation and re reimbursement of school board members uh, for travel which was adopted on October 17, 2018. Specifically, 
uh, to allow board members reimbursement for travel inside and outside a member's district. Uh, and that will be on the next uh, agenda on the October 16th meeting. Uh, my rationale for doing that, I worked in this county for 30 some years. I never asked for my travel. Uh, not that I never, but I travel a lot. And uh, in this case, I'm the person who does a lot of travel. My office is my home. And so I'd like for the board members to consider that. If you do not want to apply for your travel, that's fine. But I really would like for you to consider the fact that I do quite a bit of travel. And in closing with that, I did a great deal of traveling this week. Uh, and my husband and I on these boundary uh, situations. And when parents say that they've got a situation, you really uh, have to get in your car and drive. And I want to thank all the, the schools that did invite me to their schools. I think there's maybe some, I'm not sure when someone said, well, can principals have meetings? I think principals are kind of asked to stay out of the whole boundary situation. But I was invited into those schools. And I want to thank you. And thank you, Dr. Latif. Uh, I think you may get under midnight. <laughs> Mr. Deutsch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Uh, budget season's coming up, and uh, it's always exciting. Uh, one of the things we did last uh, year during budget season was approve an ombudsman, uh, and we funded the position. Uh, we haven't hired the position yet, and I think that position is very important for uh, what we uh, continue to do to help um, teachers, staff, and having a fair process. And just wanted to reiterate my request from the last meeting that at the upcoming meeting, uh, we begin a discussion of um, approving the policies for the ombudsman. Uh, we had set up a committee uh, for to review those um, back at the end of the last spring semester. And so hopefully we can have that committee report presented and uh, go ahead and uh, approve, hire that ombudsman. That would be awesome. Uh, and then I uh, just wanted to congratulate uh, Mr. Welk as well on the vice chairmanship. Uh, I think he should be... Uh, one of the youngest vice chairmen in uh, Prince William County School Board history. Uh, and uh, the youth and energy um, that we can bring to the school board is always important. Um, that's great. Uh, it was... Uh, Excellent uh, meeting. Congratulations, Mr. Will. Congratulations, Ms. Um, Williams. I am, um, you know, I have to tell you all that I am, it's an honor to serve up here with all of you, and, and I continue to want to do the best we can to um, address the community's concerns and work through all um, that we can to make this the county with the, a world-class education. So everyone have a great night. Have a happy new year. Thank you. <laughs>